Representatives, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk? They were all dealt with last night. All dealt with last night. Thank you. I will call the clerk to call on business. Government Business Order of the Day number 1, Treasury Laws Amendment, a tax plan for the COVID-19 Economic Recovery Bill 2020, consideration of second reading debate. Senator Polly. Mr President, I rise to speak on the Treasury Law Amendment, a tax plan for the COVID-19 Economic Recovery Bill 2020. The announcements in this bill do six things. First, they bring forward the Stage 2 tax cuts to 2020. 2021. They bring forward the removal of the low and middle income tax offset to the end of 2021 financial year to provide a temporary additional tax cut for those on incomes up to $126,000. They increase the small business turnover threshold for certain concessions to $50 million. They make amendments to their research and development tax incentive cuts. They implement the temporary loss carryback against previous profits. And lastly, they introduce the temporary full ex expensing of depreciation assets, instant asset write off. The government has introduced this omnibus tax bill for many of the major measures announced in the 2020 budget. Some of these measures have been known for some time, while others have only just been announced and rushed through. The Morrison government are throwing around money like confetti and hoping that it will stick. Labor will support the income tax cuts for low and middle income earners and argued since last year that they should be brought forward to support Australians desperately in need of more relief. These tax cuts are not the only answer to our economic recovery and will need a lot more boosting to spend power and consumption. But this is a start. These tax cuts would not be enough for older workers who have been completely forgotten about. There are, was nothing in this budget for older workers, even though they make up the bulk of JobKeeper and JobSeeker recipients. When they attempt to gain employment, how will they compete with young Australians who will receive a concession of up to $200 a week? We don't, have, we don't want to hold up these measures and their capacity to, good, to do good in the economy, but we are concerned about the collection of other measures proposed in this legislation. We have only had notice of these since Tuesday night, and the government needs to be aware that if any issues were to arise due to a lack of inquiry or scrutiny, that the buck falls squarely on them. We could have separated out these measures to deal with these and to analyse them in a more timely manner and had more than three days to investigate. The bill makes amendments to enabling eligible entities with an aggregated turnover of $10 million or more and less than $50 million to access certain small business entity tax concessions. We support the increase in these thresholds. However, there has been no additional support for small businesses. Small businesses are the backbone of our economy. They employ local people and support our local communities, and they couldn't be any more important in my home state of Tasmania. They have also been hit hardest by the Morrison's recession. Those businesses with an annual turnover of less than $10 million make up 98 per cent of all businesses in Australia. That's 98 per cent 
of Australian businesses, these small businesses that have been left out. This means that the bulk of businesses will be missing out from any form of relief from this recession. The Morrison government has forgotten about these businesses who employed millions of people and is an example of their inability to use targeted reforms. There was a collapse in business investment before this crisis began. There may this may be a result of having 22 different energy policies in the last seven years and no clear leadership. Again, none of these measures introduced in this bill present permanent changes in a way that the government will incentivise business in this country. I hope that the $27 billion that we will, be, will be spent on the instant asset write-off stimulates private sector investment. But when this support is withdrawn in the next 18 months or so and the incentives drop away, we may be left with a big hole in the budget with nothing, and I repeat, nothing to show for it. We are in the deepest, most damaging recession for almost 100 years. There is a job crisis with almost a million Australians unemployed. And the government has acknowledged that another 160,000 Australians are expected to join the unemployment queues by the end of this year. We need to do what we can to fix this with a jobs plan. We have a jobs crisis and this government and their recession is only making matters worse. Incentivising the private sector is an important part of that. Private investment needs to be stimulated and grow again. Those companies will start hiring and accelerating our recovery. We've been saying for some time we need some clarity and leadership from the government so that business can respond appropriately. Using the tax system is an important way to go about that, but it will not be our only saviour, and we need meaningful long-term reform to encourage business investment in this country. A great way to do this would be by investing in tourism and renewable energy, especially in Tasmania. But unfortunately, Tasmania has been completely left out of this budget. In fact, they've been left off the map. It's not the first time, but after seven years, Tasmanians are fed up and sick and tired of it. There is nothing in this budget at all to build confidence in the Tasmanian community. There is no plan for jobs. There's no plans for our health. There's no plans for our hospital. The budget has merely rehashed previous announcements by this government. There was a mere $13.5 million for tourism allocated to Tasmania. This industry delivers $4.5 billion a year to my home state and directly and indirectly employs 40,000 Tasmanians. But because of the border restrictions, it has been completely obliviated. We need more than the $360 million upgrades to our roads and infrastructure. We need a jobs plan. We need leadership. We need a vision. This has been such a missed opportunity by this government. The budget racked up a trillion dollars in debt a trillion dollars debt by this Liberal government. It is remarkable that the government has found room to do some of these things, but no room like helping out and supporting the childcare sector. They've done nothing at all for older workers, nothing for social housing and, as I said, nothing for Tasmania. The government is good at making announcements and saying big numbers, but there is no guarantee that they will follow through and actually deliver for the people. We know Prime Minister Morrison is there for the photo op, but is never there for the follow-up. These exist deep, there exists deep concern that the $4 billion wage subsidy will be rorted, and I might say with very good reason. It will no doubt be used to replace older workers in favour of younger ones. Jobmaker must be secure so employees will not simply employ two young casual workers and replace them with full-time employees. There must be security for these workers by ensuring that existing employees will not be replaced by subsidised workers. Jobmaker does not have the capacity to fuel 
in, they, sorry, job maker does have the capacity to do to fuel insecure and low-paid work. I just hope that this government has thought this through, because it doesn't appear, with a very quick oversight of this bill, that there is adequate safeguards. Last night, in complete contrast to this budget, Labor, through Anthony Albanese, the Labor leader, announced our plan for the future. It is a once-in-a-generation chance to reset our economy and rebuild our country for the better. Labor has proposed long-term reform, which includes a plan to revitalise manufacturing, to rewrite our energy grid, a commitment to net zero emissions by 2050, investment in social housing and in childcare. Mr Albanese also spoke about aged care. This budget quite clearly has left out so many different sectors of our community and, most importantly, from my perspective, with the crisis that we've been facing through this pandemic, now the recession and the aged care crisis in this country, this government has been left wanting yet again. We in this country have experienced 30,000 older Australians dying over the last three years while they've been waiting for their home care package that they were assessed to be in need of. That is a national disgrace. The Minister for Aged Care has been asleep at the wheel. The Prime Minister has broken his election promise from last year when he said he was going to make aged care a priority. Well, quite frankly, in the last two budgets, aged care certainly has not been a major priority for this government. Older Australians who are assessed for needing level three and four home care packages are still waiting up to 18 months and beyond. That's a national disgrace. It is quite obvious that this is the interim budget before the election budget in May next year. The downside of that budget for next year is it will not have the influence of Senator Cormann, the finance minister, who will be leaving the Senate. And I'd like to, in my speech, pay credit to Senator Cormann for his role as a senator, for a senator who comes in this place and is highly respected, but also he respects everyone else's contribution around this chamber. And I take the opportunity to wish him and his family all the very best. But getting back to the important issue of the day, and that is exposing this government's failings on the budget, to contrast that to the Labor leader Anthony Albanese's budget in reply last night, when he said, because it is Labor's view through and through, we will not leave anyone behind. That's Labor. That's the light on the hill. That's what runs through our veins as Labor members, party members, senators and members. We will not leave anyone behind. We can be a country that makes things and a country that is proud to put an Australian workforce first above all else. And we will always do that. We will put Australians first. We need to start manufacturing in this country again. We need to ensure Australians have the opportunity to go to university no matter where they live, whether they're in regional Australia or in our fantastic cities. But this government has attacked the universities yet again and those who are aspiring, whether they're young, middle-aged or old, who want to go to university, they have made it tougher and tougher for them to do it. So we need to be prepared for a new era in this country, the opportunity to reset our economy, to reset the opportunities at university, to reset the aged care sector and to reset set the job opportunities for all Australians and this budget and this government has clearly failed in their job. Thank you, Senator Polly. Senator McKim. Um, thank you, Deputy President. Well, this bill 
much like the budget that was handed down this week, contains an awful lot of brown and a fair bit of trickle down. The bill and the budget are the latest incarnation of a flawed neoliberal ideology that has dominated major party Australian politics for the last 40 odd years. This is an ideology that has seen workers getting less and less, shareholders and executives getting more and more, structural unemployment and underemployment, housing costs going through the roof, public services privatised and pillaged, wealth concentrating in the hands of the already very wealthy and, of course, the cooking of our planet, where climate polluters reap mega profits, putting in danger the very ecosystem on which all life depends just because that is what the market wanted. So while this budget does away with an obsession on surplus, the Australian Greens are not for a moment fooled that this government has changed its stripes. The budget spends big, but it spends badly. And the centrepiece of this budget and of this bill are the tax cuts that will see millionaires get two and a half thousand extra bucks a year, that will see the working poor get a measly 250 extra dollars in a year and the unemployed line up for their regular kick in the teeth. Don't be fooled by the spin. The additional offset for low and middle income earners is a one-off. It will be gone in a year's time and people will be back to where they were before this budget and before this bill. There's a temporary boost for the millions but a permanent boost for the millionaires. But not content with selling out millions of Australians, uh, giving them a day's bread while the millionaires take home the entire bakery, the government is being deceptive about how much better off people will actually be in the end. They're making the benefit for low and middle income earners look twice as big as it really is by obscuring the fact that the offset turns into a tax cut next year. They're double counting a temporary tax cut. That's where we've got to in terms of honesty in politics in this country. This is a government for whom being deceptive should be considered the starting point, and that's obvious to many Australians that are watching them closely. But it's a point that seems too difficult for the Australian Labor Party to get its collective head around. Here they are, coming in this morning, cheering on the government every step of the way. Now, the Australian Greens oppose the bringing forward of these tax cuts. In fact, we oppose stage two and stage three of the tax cuts in any form and at any time. Because these tax cuts are top end tax cuts, which of course is exactly what you'd expect from the Liberal Party, but I'm sure there are some Australians who still hold out hope that the Labor Party might actually go into bat for people doing it tough. But to give the Australian Labor Party the opportunity to, uh, to express their desire for tax cuts targeted to those who are doing it tough, the Greens have an amendment that would prevent millionaires from getting a tax cut. Now We're in the middle of the worst recession in a century. Now is not the time to be giving millionaires a tax cut. We should instead be using this money to keep job seeker and job keeper in full, to fund universal services like childcare and our universities, and undertake a massive program of government investment into clean energy, public housing, essential public services, reforesting, rewilding and public infrastructure like, for example, a light rail down the east coast of Australia. This budget also contains a massive $99 billion a year worth of welfare for the big corporations. There's $43 billion a year in contracts for weapons companies, $7 billion a year in public subsidies for private health insurers, $8 billion a year for climate polluters in the form of ta fuel tax credits, and that's before you even get to the ridiculously low rate of tax paid by them because the petroleum resource rent tax is nothing other than a rort. 
There's $13 billion in contracts to outsource the work that should be being done by the public services, particularly to the big four accounting firms who get paid twice as much just to tell the government what it wants to hear. And there's at least $3.5 billion each and every year to the major banks because, of course, the government regards them as too big to fail and the market knows that the government will bail them out no matter what their misdeeds. And boy, is the list of their misdeeds long, far too long for me to go into today, but I do refer people to the findings of the Banking Royal Commission. Add to these welfare measures, measures for big corporations uh, to those contained in this bill, namely the temporary uh, full expensing of capital expenditure and the temporary ability to carry back losses for businesses with a turnover of up to $5 billion. Now, the Greens don't outright oppose instant asset write-off facilities or the introduction of loss carryback measures. In fact, we've taken policies to successive elections calling for these measures for small business, including reinstating that which the Abbott government repealed as part of the repeal of the mining tax. But the government's policy and, indeed, this bill are completely unstrategic. They failed to put these measures together with a more comprehensive suite of reforms that deal with the structural <coughs> problems for businesses in Australia. Issues such as, an increasingly such as increasingly concentrated markets in which monopolies engage in price gouging of consumers in order to extract super profits for shareholders. Issues such as the declining share of income going to workers, not because workers aren't putting in the effort or the hours, but because our industrial system has been deregulated over the last 40-odd years and because the workforce has been atomised and individualised to the point that 40 per cent of workers in this country are now in some form of insecure work. And issues such as the impact of globalisation, both on our domestic industrial capacity and on our tax base. We should be questioning just how good trade deals have been for Australian businesses, and we should be doing far more to stop multinationals from shifting profits offshore through a complicated web of tax avoidance arrangements. So as to make these big business cut concessions more about restructuring the economy to work for people and for our planet, the Greens will move amendments to prohibit the full expensing of depreciable assets that are used for coal, gas, weapons manufacturing or tobacco, and restrict access to the full expensing of depreciable assets to those that have been produced or manufactured in Australia. These amendments would go some way towards ensuring that these business tax concessions help transition business activity so that it helps create a fairer, cleaner and more stable economy and society. Both the government and the opposition have talked a big game about rebuilding manufacturing in Australia, but unless you actually direct policy so that businesses and the government spend on Australian-made goods, then it's all just hot air. If these amendments are unsuccessful, given the government has chosen to rush them through, the responsible thing to do is oppose this package, and that is what the Greens will do. We do support a number of measures in this bill. We support Schedule 3 and the increase in the threshold of a range of tax concessions for small businesses so they will be available for businesses earning up to $50 million a year. We also support Schedules 4, 5 and 6, which deal with research and development tax incentives. These measures provide slightly larger tax benefits for companies that undertake research and development. It would have been far more prudent for the government to send this bill to an inquiry to give the Senate time to consider these changes and make sure there are no unintended consequences. But of course, the collusion of the major parties in this place to jam this bill through today with almost no opportunity for scrutiny means that we will not be able to do that. But we do support those measures that I've mentioned in this bill. Now, it's perilously curious that Labor takes up the position they do in this chamber, to the President's left, where the opposition tra traditionally sit, since they are by no, me no means anymore a left-wing party and are an opposition in name only. 
Yesterday, Senator Gallagher was complaining about how this is another omnibus bill that prevent, presents the Senate with a binary decision, and that puts Labor in, in an invidious position, hopelessly forced to vote for things they don't want to. Oh, the agony, the burden on the Labor Party is almost unbearable here. Well, the Senate can split parts out of this bill, and we will give an opportunity for the Senate to do that in our amendments. There are seven schedules to this bill that deal separately with the personal income tax cuts, big business tax concessions, small business tax concessions and R&D tax concessions. If Labor support wants to support one schedule, amend another or oppose another, then Labor could draft amendments to achieve that aim. We've got some. We hope you support them. Then we heard uh, uh, Senator McAllister talking about the failure of this budget to do anything to address the gender pay gap. And at the same time, Labor is cheering the government on to bring forward stage two of these tax cuts, in which 90 per cent of the benefit goes to people earning over $90,000, which of course means that men get over twice as much of the benefit that women get from these tax cuts. So yes, this budget and this bill do nothing to address the gender pay gap and, in fact, uh, make it worse. And that's in part because of the very tax cuts that Labor is going to queue up in here and support this morning. And then there's government debt. Labor's leader, Mr Albanese, has spent the whole COVID crisis talking about the so-called debt burden. And then he's faced with the embarrassment of having agreed to the centrepiece of the budget before he even made his budget reply speech last night. He should have just got up last night and said ditto and sat back down again. Labor's shadow treasurer, Mr Chalmers, also spent a good portion of last year's election campaign talking about the government's debt levels. And then we had yesterday, in question time, uh, the astounding circumstance in which Senator Gallagher quoted no less a body than the IPA in her questions, the Institute of Public Affairs, when asking about the size of the debt. I mean, the Labor Party must have taken a time machine back to 1929. Have they not heard of John Maynard Keynes? Do they not understand the concept of countercyclical spending? Has the Labor Party so missed the moment, a moment in which the world is putting to sleep the deficit hawks that they have resorted to quoting the I? P.A. in question time. How embarrassing for a once proud political party quoting the IPA on government debt while voting for tax cuts for the millionaires. Labor has drunk the neoliberal Kool-Aid and has forgotten what the effects of these policies are on the people, many of whom put their faith in the Labor Party at the ballot box. Now, we would have amended this bill to repeal stages two and three of the tax cuts, but our advice was that that was beyond the powers of the Senate. So our amendments will be as I categorised them earlier in my speech. And I want to put on the record that even though we do support elements of this legislation taken as a whole, which I very much expect is uh, what the Senate will require us to do because of uh, the dirty secret deal done on these tax cuts and on this legislation by the ALP and the government, uh, that we will not be able to split out elements of this bill and we will be forced to take it as a package. And if we are forced by the Senate to take this bill as a package, notwithstanding the fact that we do support elements of this legislation, as I outlined earlier, we will vote against this package if we are forced to take it as a whole, because on balance the bad outweighs the good. And we are not going to get up and swallow this neoliberal ideology based on the failed model of trickle-down economics just because the major parties have done a deal to jam this legislation through with no opportunity for the Senate to run through its normal processes, uh, no opportunity for an inquiry so that we can hear from people who are impacted by this legislation. And once again, the trickle down will win in this place when we know that after 40 odd 
years of trickle-down economics. The people who are doing it toughest in this country are still waiting with their palms outstretched for those first drops to trickle down into their hands. The people. Senator McKim, your time has expired. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. In making a few brief remarks uh, this morning on the bill before us, I think it's very much worth highlighting that this bill really does fail the test of what our nation needs at the moment in terms of a strong budget uh, uh, for our nation. We have an opportunity now to rebuild our nation uh, after this pandemic. Uh, and during this pandemic, and to reset some fundamental policy settings amongst it. But what this budget does, and indeed what uh, is most telling about the bill before us, is not what is in it, but frankly what is not in it. There is no real plan for Australian manufacturing in what the government has put forward. There is no plan for jobs and economic recovery. Instead, this government has put forward uh, a plan for the nation that simply uh, leaves people behind. As the Leader of the Opposition outlined very ably in his budget reply last night. So while Labor supports uh, the measures before us today, it's timely that we remember that we are aspiring to something much better as a nation. Nobody should left behind, be left behind as this budget has left behind older Australians, as it's left behind our university students, as it's left behind uh, the manufacturing industries of our nation, as it's left behind uh, people who are facing unemployment as it's left behind people whose uh, job subsidies will expire. This year has been the year from hell for so many Australians, too many Australians. And this budget does not, is not skilled enough and adept enough at drilling down into the solutions that we need for tomorrow. Training, education and training, quality childcare, rebuilding our manufacturing sector and powering our, our recovery with clean energy. It is time that we took this crisis and really sought to pull the levers of change uh, for the Australian people. I condemn this government for not putting forward an adequate suite of policies and plans. Uh, but Today, as we support this legislation in simply getting on uh, with uh, some of the basic things that need to be done, I highlight uh, that it's high time that we had a real vision for our nation, as Anthony Albanese, the Leader of the Opposition, so ably put forward last night. Thank you, Senator, Senator the President. Uh, thanks, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, this uh, consideration of this bill occurs against the backdrop of the deepest recession since 1929. A million, more than a million Australians unemployed, and even on the government's own figures, 160,000 more Australians to lose their jobs between now and Christmas. Well, the recent history of recessions in my lifetime charts the course of not just the economic development of the country, but of the character of the governments who presided over the recessions. The recession in the late 1970s, early 1980s, the Fraser and Howard recession, uh, was a deep and lasting recession that caused untold damage to Australian families and Australian business. And it was the Hawke-Keating period of the 1980s and the opportunity that they took coming out of the recession uh, to rebuild the Australian economy that told the story of that recovery. The Accords floating the Australian dollar, industry and industrial reform, entirely reconfiguring the Australian economy, Medicare, the social wage, enormous achievements, opposed, of course, every step of the way 
by the characters on the other side of this chamber. Big achievements. Big achievements. Senator Smith, don't shake your head. Voted against all of it. The great achievements made for the country in the middle of a recession, using the opportunity to rebuild the Australian economy. The recession of the early 1990s that occurred when uh, Hawke was the Prime Minister and Keating was the Treasurer is called the Hawke and Keating recession by those opposite. What was the Keating response? Working nation. One per cent of GDP spent on infrastructure, a plan for jobs, and what came out of that? 30 years of economic growth. Not much reform in the intervening period, 30 years of economic growth. Well, now we have the Morrison recession. A trillion dollars in debt, unemployment continuing, very high rates for four years, and what will we have to show for it? We have a recession that will be deeper and longer because of the policy failings of this government. It will be the Morrison recession because of your policy failings and your lack of character in dealing with these deep national changes, these deep national challenges. It will be deeper and longer because Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, is going to cut job keeper and job seeker programs that Labor argued for. See, job keeper has kept hundreds of thousands of Australians connected with their workplaces. It's kept tens of thousands of Australian businesses afloat, but the cuts in JobKeeper in the lead up to March next year will mean that 160,000 Australians lose their jobs between now and Christmas, and who knows how many thousands of Australian businesses will close. We'll have an insolvency-led recovery, perhaps. You can't just announce your way out of a recession. You have to work your way out of a recession. The recession will be deeper and longer because of this trillion-dollar trickle-down budget. Four years of continued high unemployment, no jobs plan. The only plan that exists is shoveling hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars out the door to big business with a grab bag of announcements and no plan and hoping for the best. See, it's not the size of the deficit that counts in this situation, it's what you do with it. The recession will be deeper and longer because the economy was in diabolical trouble before the coronavirus pandemic landed on our shores. Wages were flatlining, job quality was declining, 1.8 million Australians were unemployed or looking for more work, productivity was falling, growth was flatlining. This is, no matter how much you wriggle, the Morrison recession. You broke it. You own it. And we saw the spectacle of the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, invoking the sort of desiccated, discredited economic uh, icons of his, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, three weeks ago. Now, the Prime Minister wanted him to be quiet and not say that. Well, he really wanted to say it. He said it once, he said it twice, he said it three times. He wanted to talk about Maggie Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. But the truth is he did us all a favour because it showed what's at the desiccated heart of this miserable budget. It's going to be a continuation of that trickle-down economic agenda. Trickle-down, trillion-dollar budget. Shovel it out the door to business and hope that it trickles down to ordinary pay people. I heard Senator Scar and others the other day say that it's time for government to get out of the way. Well, this is hardly getting out of the way. It's uh, a colossal failure of economic management and national government character. We saw the contrast last night 
with the Leader of the Opposition's speech. No one held back, no one left behind. Practical nation-building initiatives that are going to make a real difference to Australian families and, and real reforms that are going to have a lifelong effect on Australian national productivity and capacity. Rewiring the nation, getting past the climate wars that have held this country back, the climate wars between the maddest ends and the slightly less mad ends of the coalition climate argument. Getting past that, the coalition that has had 22 energy policies since it was elected. A technology neutral plan to modernise the Australian electricity system. I've, I've never been wound up before by the, uh, by the uh, leader of the government in the Senate, but, but, but I will pay attention given it's your last day, uh, Senator Cormann. Uh, a plan for manufacturing and building trains here in Australia a jobs guarantee and a skills guarantee for Australian apprentices and the childcare plan that just shows how little there was in the coalition budget for Australian women. A coalition budget that spent more in new spending on computers for Services Australia than they spent on Australian women. They are practical initiatives, practical plans and a pathway to a better, fairer, more decent Australia. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Just to assist the whips in the managing of the speaker's list, I'm going to go to Senator Waters, followed by Senator Roberts, then back to the speaker's list with Senator Seaworth. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment, our tax plan for the COVID-19 Economic Recovery Bill 2020. But it's not really a tax plan for the economic recovery uh, of this nation. It's a plan for yet more handouts for big corporates—$99 billion in freebies to this government's corporate donor mates. Now, they talk a big game, but the, the recipients and the beneficiaries of this tax package are abundantly clear. This bill locks in the transfer of hundreds of billions of dollars in corporate welfare at the expense of public services and people who need help. Now, <clears throat> despite the record spending, this tax cut package will leave so many Australians behind. And the centrepiece of the budget, of course, is bringing forward the tax cuts that this bill facilitates. Now, let's be clear about what these tax cuts do. They take hundreds of billions of dollars that could be going to fund childcare, schools, universities, hospitals, public housing frontline domestic family and violence services or renewable energy, create jobs, repair the safety net for those out of work. But no, this bill takes that money and it gives it to the corporations and the millionaires, not the millions that need it. Now, this government says that the tax cuts are needed to get the economy moving, to put money in the pockets of everyday Australians, but the benefits of this tax cuts are not distributed evenly. Under this bill, 96 per cent of the tax cut package goes to the top 30 per cent of income earners. The bottom 70 per cent of the population ju gets just 4 per cent of the money. These tax cuts are a trickle-down con. And of course, they benefit men twice as much as women. Now, low- and middle-income earners they get a boost in one year. They get a, uh, a $1,000 boost from the one-off extension of the LMITO, the Low and Middle Income Tax Offset, but that's it. And when LMITO runs out next year, that temporary benefit is gone and the tax benefit for the well-off remains. A temporary boost for the millions, but a permanent boost for the millionaires. And when the stage three tax cuts kick in in four years' time, as they're scheduled to do, thanks to the capitulation of the so-called opposition, 50 per cent of the benefits will go to the top 10 per cent of income earners. Now, I'm sure Australians know that at the moment one in three of the biggest companies in this country pays no tax. Well, under this bill, that'll go up to two out of three. It is absolutely outrageous. We should not be going into unprecedented debt just to line the pockets of billionaires and companies that are already making healthy profits while leaving behind the young, older workers, women, First Nations people, people with a disability and anyone who hasn't donated to the Liberal Party. 
And of course, tax cuts mean nothing if you don't have a job. This government is offering the trinket of 20 bucks a week to low-income earners, but it's just taken $150 a week out of the pockets of everyone on job seeker or job keeper. It's offering tax cuts to Clive Palmer, but next to nothing for families trying to put food on the table. In a recession where one million people are unemployed, there is no justification for bringing forward tax cuts for millionaires. And according to the budget papers, the cost of these tax cuts, when all the stages are implemented, is around $50 billion a year. Now, a government with vision and leadership would use that kind of money to create a future for all of us. For about half that increase in debt, we could fund 100 per cent renewable energy. We could reinvigorate the manufacturing sector with green hydrogen. We could have free childcare. We could have free education, tertiary, secondary, right from the very earliest age, right through um, for people's whole lives. We could build one million new public houses that could put a roof over every person's head in this country and lift people out of poverty by giving everyone in this country an income they can actually live on. We could make sure that we have world-class, affordable health care, that carers are properly rewarded, that everyone has access to public transport. We could reinvigorate the manufacturing sector with clean energy, with green hydrogen. We can make sure that any person subject to abuse, because we know that spiked in COVID, could access support services, crisis accommodation and financial and legal advice when and where they need them. And all of this could happen if we make millionaires and big corporations pay their fair share and invest in a green recovery. So we will not be supporting this bill, and we will continue to fight for the millions, not the millionaires. We will fight for gender equality and sustainable industry and a fairer future. And my, my colleague, Senator McKim, has already outlined the amendments uh, that we will be moving in this place. We will move to defer that tax cut for millionaires because in a recession, when you've just cut job seeker and job keeper, tax cuts for millionaires should not be being rammed through the Senate after three days of the bill having been intro introduced with no Senate inquiry where you are trying to sail through and cover up the fact that 96 per cent of the benefits go to those that do not need any extra help. If you've got $99 billion in the bottom drawer for your corporate mates, why on earth did you just cut job seeker and job keeper? If you want stimulus, you should have kept those measures at their temporary boosted rate. All of the, econo all of the economists say that. There is no dispute about that. Investing in housing, investing in childcare, investing in people is how you actually help this nation and get the economy going. So we'll be moving that amendment, but uh, unfortunately we know that the so-called opposition has once again capitulated to this government and they will just ram through these tax cuts for millionaires um, and we sadly don't expect any support from them on that amendment. Now we'll also be moving to make sure that the instant asset write-off um, a policy which we have supported in the past, where it has uh, appropriate limits that genuinely helps small business, stimulates business spending um, and helps out local manufacturing. Um, but we will be moving to make sure that big coal, big gas, tobacco and defence manufacturers cannot access that. This boost in accelerating depreciation and allowing companies to write off capital expenditure, that should go to support a green recovery. It should go to support products that are manufactured here in Australia. That's the other amendment we'll move. If you want to get an instant asset write-off of 100 per cent, you should be buying Australian-made goods. Now, I think the opposition leader sort of alluded to something similar to that last night in his speech. Are the Labor Party actually going to vote for that amendment? It's a very sensible amendment, but uh, we'll see if they're once again all talk and no follow-through. Um, now, the other amendment that we'll move <coughs> is to make sure that these tax cuts actually are not brought forward, that the loss carryback provisions, which could have been good for small business, but this chamber hasn't given us the time to scrutinise them. So I'm afraid we will have to oppose those because it will be an excuse for yet more tax minimisation by big corporates. And we'll also be moving that the instant asset write-off stays where it is. We think that limit 
of a, a cap of 150,000 for expenditure with companies of a turnover of up to half a billion, we think that's a fair place to draw the line. That helps small business, but this, this government wants to lift that to businesses that earn up to $5 billion in turnover. Yet another handout for big corporates that don't need the help. And you've just cut JobSeeker. The, I mean, the contrast could not be more stark. This is a government for its big corporate donors, and the rest of Australia is crying out for some help, for some vision and for some leadership. Well, we here at the Greens are happy to deliver that. We will be opposing this bill. There are parts of it that we would have supported, but of course the government's putting it through as a whole. We would have inquired into this bill and its flagrant support for the millionaires would have been revealed. Perhaps the opposition might have decided to be in opposition if they had have taken the time to see the impacts of these tax cuts. But there was no Senate inquiry. It's been rammed through. We're here on an unscheduled sitting day debating a package that will benefit uh, the top 30 per cent of income earners when you have just cut JobSeeker. Well, shame on this government. The Australian public know that your priorities are your corporate donors and your fancy corporate jobs that you're going to go off to after politics. Well, this community deserves better after the hell of a year that we've all suffered through, and you've delivered them a kick in the teeth. Senator Waters. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I speak in support of this legislation. This is an omnibus bill, as everyone knows, and it covers many topics. And I'll cover many of them, and I'll widen it to include the budget context needed for these to be effective. So where are these measures and the budget taking our country? Where are the budget's crafters taking our country? So I'd like to first of all start with sharing my feelings and needs when I listen to two of our staffers who are in the budget lockdown share the details that they learned in that lockdown. I was actually stunned and quite concerned, deeply concerned in fact, because it undermined my faith in the governance of this country. It didn't meet my needs for integrity, reassurance, security and leadership. So I want to make that very clear. I also, though, Mr Acting Deputy President, want to acknowledge that last Wednesday, two days ago, was the 10th anniversary of my first challenge, personal challenge to the Greens, and I'll discuss more of that later. Firstly, the personal tax cuts have been brought forward and backdated. That could, have, could offset big tax bills at the end of the year for the people on JobKeeper. So we, we wonder about the timing, but nonetheless we applaud bringing forward those tax cuts. Pensions, there'll be two lots of $250 each in December and in March. Now there's an assumption in the budget, one of many critical assumptions, that there will be a, a, vir a vaccine in July 2021. That indicates no plan for managing COVID. Instead, we will continue in this country to have COVID managing us. Job maker scheme, for those under 20, there'll be $200 a week subsidy for two paid to employers. For those between 30 and 35, there'll be $100 a week. Nothing is being done for those, the other 30% the of people who are over 55. And that's age discrimination, but it could also lead to retail churn, and the retail sector is known to do that, uh, jumping on these incentives. So that is a concern to us, and it will need to be managed. Now, I understand this is a budget bill, so there will be not much opportunity to change it. Immigration. In 2018-2019, with 240,000 net migrants into our country. In 2019-2020, in that dropped to 154. This year, 2020 and 2021, there'll be minus 72,000, largely we presume because overseas students leaving. 2021-2022, it starts to climb back up again. And 22-23, we're back to our huge numbers of, Im of immigrants. So that is of concern. The GDP in the last decade has increased because of immigration, nothing about productivity. The instant write-off measure, anything can be written off and any company can get it. Up to $5 billion turnover company, including foreign companies. So where will that money be going? Revenue, 
little has changed. Tobacco and alcohol, $22 billion. Tobacco will make up, make up $15.3 billion of that. And that could drive more people to drugs for cheaper thrills. More dangerous, that'll mean more danger and harm to society. We have to question some of the underlying assumptions and presumptions in the, in the budget, not only this year, but m moving into the future. Infrastructure, Emu Swamp Dam. It's not ready yet to be approved, but we applaud the government for funding this. Um, we think it's necessary. It's absolutely vital for the people of Stanthorpe in southeastern Queensland. But there are no nation-building programs, no hybrid Bradfield, no WA pipeline uh, from your uh, state bringing the gas east. There's no vision for our future. Roads and bridges will be upgrading existing roads, but nothing to improve productivity, nothing to create future national wealth. Not one project in this budget goes beyond the life of this budget. Manufacturing strategy. We see there's a $1.5 billion modern manufacturing initiative. Nice slogan, nice word, sounds good. There's also uh, investment in supply chain resilience. How are we going to do this with the world's dearest electricity? How can we do that when manufacturing costs are so dependent upon cheap electricity? That's the secret to why our jobs have gone from here to places like China, India and Asia. We have gone from having the cheapest electricity in the world to the dearest because of government regulations from both the Labor Party, the Labor Greens coalition government with Julia Gillard and the Liberal Party, National Party coalition government under John Howard and subsequent prime ministers. The budget wants to, says it wants to process agricultural products here. Where's the water? We need water. And then we come to job forecasts. For each large initiative in the budget, there was a forecast, forecasted number of jobs created. And our staff put together a tally. The total jobs is more than the current total number of unemployed trainees and apprenticeships. And then when you add the jobs up in the budget, it doesn't add up. Are these empty, hollow projections meant to grab headlines for each initiative? And then tax. Senator Hansen has been pursuing multinationals to be taxed fairly in this country for two and a half decades. I've joined her in the last five years. Multinationals continue to avoid tax. Gas exporters export our wealth and pay no tax here, or virtually no tax here. Yet the Japanese government collects $3 billion from uh, our gas imports into Japan. That the big end of town has been given the right to claim back tax that they have already paid. Losses in 2019-20 and 2020-21 can be reclaimed from tax already paid in 2018-19. For years, in response to One Nation exposing the multinationals paying little or no tax, this government has pretended to chase foreign corporations to pay their fair share of tax. This produced a small increase in tax from people like Google and Apple. Now the government is giving it all back. Australian companies and employers continue to be at a 30 per cent disadvantage because multinationals are not paying tax. The Liberal, Labor, Nationals and Greens governments have served the multinationals by avoiding this issue. The Greens talk about it, but that in, in power with Julia Gillard, they didn't do anything about it. Tax reform is an absolute essential topic that we must face up to, including state payroll tax. We need a summit. We need the, to get back to con our constitution's competitive federalism and give the states their power. As I see it, this budget has some, has some worthwhile initiatives, but it is largely headline grabbing, smoke and mirrors all to look good, not do good. A budget that marketing people built to grab headlines. People with limited understanding of the basic production needs of a healthy economy, a healthy society, a healthy community, basic production needs for business and investment. Let's start, about, let's start with what a productive economy, economic environment needs. First of all, cheap electricity, human progress has been a result of ever decre decreasing costs of energy, including electricity. Recent coalition electricity plans 
started off a few months ago with coal being prime. That was around the election time. They caught up with that One Nation and started using our mantra of pushing coal. Just about a month ago, they released a new plan full of unreliables. You might know them as renewables. Unreliables and gas. No mention of coal. And just a couple of weeks ago, they mentioned the future technologies. $15 billion to be wasted on unproven and high cost, inefficient, inherently impossible energy because these energy, these energy uh, drivers, are, energy generators, are really consume more energy than will be produced. $15 billion in a recession on a folly to grab headlines. I've discussed the Moran report, written by notable economist Dr Alan Moran. He cannot be refuted because his figures simply uh, consolidate figures from budget documents from state and federal governments, department and agency documents. They show that there is an extra $13 billion on top of basic electricity charges in this country due to unreliables, in other words, renewables. $13 billion extra. That works out at $1,300 average per household per year, every year. The government's figure of 6.5 per cent of the typical family household electricity bill due to renewables is not true. It is 39 per cent. No wonder people are hurting. This is a highly regressive tax on the poor and the vulnerable. And Dr Moran referenced studies showing that for every green, so-called green energy job created, 2.2 jobs are lost in the real economy, the productive economy. And he also recently calculated, conservatively, the, the average subsidy for wind turbines in this country at $536,000 per turbine per year for 15-year contracts. At the end of 2019, there were 2,691 wind turbines in Australia, and that equates to $21.6 billion in subsidies in their short and environmentally damaging lifetime. The world's most astute and successful investor is Warren Buffett, who says that wind turbines are a poor investment. He wouldn't touch them. But with subsidies, wind turbines are a fabulous investment, he says, because of their guaranteed income. There you have it. Unproductive, soon to be blights on the environment. And then we see the Prime Minister's coalition ally, the leader of the opposition in the Queensland, Deb Frecklington, coming up with a plan yesterday to splurge 500, almost $500 million in subsidies to sub subsidise the electricity costs for manufacturing businesses. How the hell can we lower the cost of power by subsidising it. So we're going to subsidise the reduction to offset the subsidies that are causing these unreliables to, to raise prices. Donald Trump has proven the importance of affordable energy. He has driven the American re recovery, economic recovery, remarkably until COVID hit. Remarkably. And all he's done is uh, drive cheap energy, enable cheap energy. Second thing we need is reliable water. Third thing, tax reform, comprehensive tax reform. Fourth thing, we need industrial relations laws to be enforced but to also be simplified, to make it easy to hire people and less risky to hire people. We need to stop exploiting casuals. We need the Labor Party to step up and do its work there and help us hold the government accountable, pseudo-casuals. The IR system has completely broken down in this country because it's not being enforced. It's being allowed to be bypassed. We need to address red tape, green tape, blue tape and purple tape. Blue tape being UN tape and purple tape being policies that are based on academic falsehoods and misrepresentations. We need an Office of Science, Integrity and Quality Assurance. And we need to end PC, political correctness. Be real and truthful based on data. Facts beat feelings. Feelings lead to fear. Facts and data liberate. As it stands now, this budget is not about democracy, it is about hypocrisy. So in summary for the budget, there are some minor positive initiatives. There is nothing to create an economic environment for Australian investment. There is nothing to increase productive capacity. There is nothing to restore economic sovereignty. We have gone in this country from 
independence to dependence via the UN's mantra of intradependence, in interdependence, which is really dependence. There is nothing in this budget for productivity improvements, the source of all wealth and higher living standards. There is nothing to address the basics. We're pleased in One Nation that the Prime Minister and Treasurer are using One Nation concepts and terms, productive capacity, economic sovereignty, but they need action, not hollow words. Instead of many slogans, we need real action. The Prime Minister from Marketing is starting to become known as the Prime Minister from Announcements. There is no direction, there is no, act, no strategy, there is not even a narrative in this budget. We also need a plan for managing COVID, a real plan. We can't just keep letting COVID manage us. There's no plan A, let alone a plan B alternative. We must get back to that. The core disease in this country that I see is coming from Canberra and some of the states. There is no major policy that is data-driven. That is the crux of our problem. Everything is ideologically driven, emotionally driven, fantasy driven, slogan driven, lies driven, climate catastrophe, mass extinction, living through collapse, cooking the planet. This is the stuff that comes from the south end of a northbound bull. And let me say it's now 10 years since I first challenged Senator Larissa Waters to produce the evidence for her claims and their misrepresentations of science, climate and humanity. Until we get to the truth, Thank we will you, continue Senator living Roberts. in a fantasy. Senator Patrick. Thank you. Um, Madam, Madam Acting Deputy President, I rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment, a tax plan for the COVID-19 Economic Recovery Bill 2020. However, I do so from a rather uninformed position. This bill proposes $49 billion of lost tax receipts. It has an explanatory memorandum, which is 166 pages, and we've had no opportunity to scrutinise the bill. One might ask the question, why? Why is that the case? Well, it's not as Senator Polly suggested, where she said that uh, the lack of scrutiny lay squarely at the feet of the coalition. It's completely wrong. It's the role of the opposition to scrutinise what the government does. This bill will be the subject of no scrutiny because Labor agreed with the government to let the bill go through the chamber today. Senator Gallagher says that the Labor will look at the provisions of the bill at estimates. Well, I agree. That's where you will uncover faults and unintended consequences. But you will not be able to change anything, and you know that. You say it's to get the money flowing. Now, this is $49 billion of tax receipts that we are giving up, and you couldn't wait five weeks of scrutineering time, including estimates, before you capitulated. So I'm thinking of assisting the Labor Party in its marketing. I'm going to go out and help you find a mascot, and it's going to be a dog, and it's going to be a dog that rolls over. It's going to be one that rolls over the moment any member of the coalition walks into the room. Your response in this regard is inconsistent with the very good speech that Mr Albanese delivered last night in the other place. It was a good opposition speech. He talked the talk last night. This morning you're back into the usual not walking the walk. Moving to the bill, I do have some concerns in relation to assumptions that uh, underlie this bill. Um, we, we should rightfully get to understand uh, about the assumptions before we make decisions on the bill. There is uh, an assumption in the budget talking about a population-wide COVID-19 vaccine program falling in place by 2021. Now, as I said last night, we've seen optimism in talking about a vaccine where, where dates have been given and then extended and then extended and then extended. According to Mr Trump, we should have had a vaccine uh, next month by November. We need to be very careful. Vaccines do take a long time to uh, develop and test properly. 
And of course, we, the, you know, the budget uh, uh, talks about uh, limited international travel. Now, we don't know the full picture. In these sorts of situations, we should be hoping for the best and planning for the worst. I'm concerned about the sensitivity of the economic forecasting. I mentioned last night that uh, in the, in the uh, 1920 budget, there was a, uh, a number in there on the price of uh, iron ore, $55 a tonne. That was uh, Treasury's estimates. We've gone through a, a significant international crisis and then I, I look into the, these budget papers and the same assumption sitting there that it's going to be $55 a tonne. So I'm a bit concerned. Uh, I also note that there are a number, numbers of jobs quoted in the budget papers, but no real explanation as to how those came about. So with my caveat in place about the lack of scrutiny, I'm prepared to say that unlike the Job Ready Graduate Bill. This bill does have some good points, but caution is required. We are bringing forward personal income uh, tax thresholds. That will provide immediate benefit with the reduction in PAYG. However, I am concerned about the skewing of these tax cuts towards the wealthy, who will likely bank their uh, additional uh, tax rather than spend it which is the purpose for which uh, we're granting the tax cut to, to provide stimulus. So I will be looking at the Greens amendments. They've only just been circulated. Um, uh, I will certainly be giving them some consideration. The full expensing of depreciating uh, assets. Now I went through um, in the 40, uh, uh, 44th parliament, the, uh, sorry, 45th parliament, the, uh, the tax cuts the corporate tax cuts arguments. And, uh, uh, at, that, uh, at that point in time, you know, the alternate suggestion to simply dropping the corporate tax rates was, in fact, to look at things like uh, depreciating assets. And it wasn't an, accept an acceptable proposition for the government. So it is interesting that they have included this measure, $26 billion uh, uh, of measures. Uh, I am a bit concerned that uh, we might see a large proportion of those funds simply go overseas as we import um, uh, equipment and so forth. The temporary uh, loss carryback. Now, this gives a helping hand to profitable businesses that have been paying their taxes and have fallen on, on hard times as a result of COVID-19. That uh, seems quite reasonable. However, uh, uh, and this is a, 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 a perverse but uh, unintended be benefit in that uh, there are those companies that have been rorting the system and paying no tax that will get no benefit out of this. So that's a good thing. This budget will deliver a net debt of $703 billion this year, rising to, uh, to an eye-watering $1 trillion in 2024. Now, debt's not necessarily evil. As long as it's occur, uh, incurred obtaining something that will provide tangible benefit for the future and that the, de the, that the debt can be repaid. Th these changes forecast, uh, result in a forecast loss of tax receipts or income for the government of uh, $8 billion, $440 million for this financial year and $49 billion, $725 million over the forward estimates. You just got to ask the question: How does the how do these uh, tax cuts uh, fit into a plan for Australia? Is this consistent with some clear vision for Australia? Well, I question uh, that on the basis of some of the underlying uh, uh, the underlying basis for some of this, the, the decisions. I remember when the tax cuts were being proposed. Um, uh, just after the election, um, the economy was strong and there were calls from the government saying this is the perfect time to reduce PAYG because the economy is strong. Now we're in a, uh, 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 a recession 
Uh, there's been an international crisis, and the government's saying this is the perfect time to have PAYG relief. People might uh, uh, question how you come to the same conclusion with completely different sets of circumstances. So that, uh, that, that in itself is uh, perhaps a little bit worrying. Um, then there's, the, the, there's a flip-flopping concern that I have uh, raised in this budget. The, the loss carryback, that, that's a case of back to the past, a recommendation from the Henry View implemented by the Gillard government and then repealed by uh, the Abbott government, and now it's back. And then there's the R&D tax con, uh, incentive. The history of potentially cutting back the R&D uh, tax incentives is interesting. It's the classic flip-flop strategy. I said no originally, then I said yes, then I've said no, and I've stuck to it. A bit more gravitas this time because it was no by the government by a government chair committee, then yes uh, with this latest government uh, bill on R&D, and then no as just advised by the Treasurer. The question is, will they stick to it? It's clear the government will be receiving less money. We have to be, uh, therefore have to be very diligent, diligent about how we might spend that money. We may, must make sure that we get bang for buck as we move forward to get the best results for our economy. Ultimately, I will support this bill, perhaps with amendments, but definitely with some reservations. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to contribute to the debate on the Treasury Laws Amendment, a tax plan for COVID-19 Economic Recovery Bill 2020. Um, we've, of course, sitting an extra day, so this can be rammed through the parliament without any scrutiny before estimates um, before there's a committee inquiry, we did try and refer this inquiry to committee, but it, uh, neither of the, uh, the government or the opposition supported a Senate inquiry into the very uh, deep ramifications of this bill. This bill amends the income tax laws payable by individuals in 2020-21. Uh, income year and later income years by bringing forward changes to income tax thresholds. Let's call this bill out for what it is, the coalition accelerating personal tax cuts for millionaires while millions of unemployed people get nothing. These tax cuts give $2,500 to millionaires while unemployed and underemployed people basically get a, tick, a kick in the teeth. Neither the government nor the opposition made commitments to people who are unemployed, stuck on job seeker during either the budget or, in the opposition's case, the budget in reply. Job seekers are desperate to know what their future is. And of course, they do want jobs, they do want to be employed, but the reality is we will continue to see a high rate of unemployment for a long time to come. And at the moment, both the government and the opposition seem to be quite okay about not giving those people any surety about their future. The government mentioned job seekers a whole three times in the budget speech, but none of those three times did they give any, any signal to those who are currently trying to survive on JobSeeker and the reduced coronavirus supplement. No, at no time did the government give them any surety that they will, in fact, not be condemned to $40 a day in December or any surety that they, the government will ensure that they do not end up below the poverty line. This legislation is, sh is short-sighted. It's a sugar hit with no evidence it will prove, it will prove to generate economic stimulus, because bulk, the bulk of the money is going to the already well-off. Where's the evidence to show that these tax cuts will actually stimulate the economy? There's literally no guarantee that high-income earners who stand to benefit the most from this, these changes 
There's no guarantee that they're going to go out and spend the extra money, particularly while the borders are still closed. But even so, the evidence suggests they will save it, whereas those on JobSeeker they spend the bulk of the money because they need to to make ends meet. Most economists agree that tax cuts won't be as effective in getting us out of this recession. We are here today on a Friday to debate tax cuts that are going to give the least to people who already have the least, increasing inequality in this country. I'm urging all Australians, don't be fooled by the spin and the promise of this sugar hit. These tax cuts aren't what you think they are. In fact, low- and middle-income earners lose their extra $1,000 a year next year, while the rich get to keep their tax cuts. From 2021-22, from 96 per cent of the net benefit of the tax cuts goes to the top 30 per cent, while the bottom 70 per cent are left with only 4 per cent. Furthermore, these tax cuts hurt women, delivering $2.2 at $2.28 to men for every dollar they deliver to women from 2021-22. Let's just have a look at job creation. The government has predicted that the tax cuts will cost $16.9 billion in the next financial year alone and create 50,000 jobs. But research undertaken by the Australia Institute shows that if we invest that uh, $16.9 billion evenly across the employment intensive sectors of university education, childcare, healthcare, aged care, which we desperately need, and the creative arts. We would generate, listen to this, 210,506 jobs. That's a whopping 160,506 more jobs than the tax cuts would generate. Sounds like a very good investment to me. Not only do we stimulate the economy, but more importantly, we get so many more people back into work, but also we improve aged care, health care, the arts, which, is, have, as Senator Hanson Young has so clearly articulated in this place, have been so far left behind. And of course, university education, which we know already that this government is at war with. Not only would this create investment in the care economy, create more jobs, it would also ensure that we have teachers, childcare work workers, nurses and aged care workers to deliver those essential services. I'm deeply disappointed that the government has missed such a critical opportunity to invest in our care economy. That is where we'll generate jobs. That's where we start to make changes. This bill does not represent a long-term investment in the future of all Australians. It picks a lucky few based on their high income and, as a result, only serves to increase and exacerbate inequality in this country. This government is going to entrench and widen inequality when they have the opportunity to address that issue. Income inequality and wealth inequality are already rife in this country. They were rife before COVID hit and have only been made worse and will be made worse by this budget and these tax cuts. Somebody in a household that falls in the highest 20 per cent income group has six times as much as someone in the lowest 20 per cent income group. This is, this is the situation here. The average income of the highest 5 per cent income group is nine times that of the lowest 20 per cent income groups. People in the highest 20 per cent income group receive 42 per cent of all national income. People in the lowest 20 per cent income group receive only 6 per cent of all household income. The highest 5 per cent wealth group had, av had average wealth of $6 million. The wealth of the highest 1 per cent wealth group averaged $14 million. Australia has the fifth highest number in the world of people with ultra-high wealth, more than US $500 million. Pe people with high incomes, with the highest incomes in the world and are the most wealthy, don't need tax cuts. Bring for bringing forward tax cuts will, will 
while simultaneously cutting the coronavirus supplement by $300 a fortnight, is heartbreaking for people on the job seeker payment. And my heart goes out to all those Australians who are struggling at the moment. Hundreds of people have contacted my office already to express their distress and anguish at the thought that the job seeker payment is going back to $40 a day in December, and this government has made no guarantee that it won't. Shameful. They have given no certainty to the people on job seekers. But it's okay, you millionaires. You're going to get your tax cut. Don't you worry. We'll give you certainty. We'll give you certainty, and those on low income will try and fool Australia that you're getting money too. But we're going to take that extra thousand dollars off you next year. But don't you worry, job seekers. Don't you worry. You will keep you in uncertainty because apparently that's what's good for them. Don't you worry. We're looking after the millionaires. We're guaranteeing them money, but we're not going to guarantee you, job seekers, money because there may be a job in the future. Well, we already know there's 12 people looking for every job at the moment, and we know that's not going to improve. This is a bad budget. These are, this is bad legislation. You put a few good things in there, which, as Senator McKim has highlighted, we could support. But of course, you don't put them separately. You put them with these massive, offensive tax cuts for the wealthy while you deliver nothing. You kick job seekers in the teeth. They have no certainty. The people trying to get by, they're going forward to Christmas looking, looking at trying to survive on $40 a day. Well, thanks for nothing will be their message to you. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I rise to contribute to this debate today, and I just wanted to start with the title of this bill: a tax plan for the COVID-19 economic recovery bill. Well, that's the first con job. It does nothing to actually deal with the economic crisis that we are confronted with today. And why is that? Because we're in an economic crisis from this pandemic. Because we have a million people out of work. We have people from the hospitality sector, from the retail sector, from the tourism sector, from the arts and the entertainment industries who have all lost their jobs because of the restrictions and the health response that was needed. We are in a recession that overwhelmingly impacts young people. We are in a recession that overwhelmingly impacts women. We are in a recession where it is the working poor and the unemployed in this country who are carrying the burden. And what does this bill do? It doesn't address any of those economic crises. It doesn't make life better for the unemployed. It spends tens of billions of dollars helping people who are actually managing OK at the moment. The millionaires of this country are doing pretty well in comparison to those who have lost their job. This legislation confronts us with a choice. If the government has made a decision to spend billions of money and get that out the door to try and stimulate the economy in the midst of this economic crisis, they need to make a choice as to where this money goes. And what the government has decided to do in this budget and with this bill is that they have chosen the wealthy over the poor. They have chosen men over women. They have chosen mining executives over aged care workers. They have chosen millionaires over those people who have lost their jobs. This government's choices are clear, stark and rooted in an obscene ideology that says if you're at the bottom end of the income brackets, oh well, that's your fault. This budget and this bill, these tax cuts, are rooted in the belief that money will trickle down. Well, we know that's not true. That is a con job. Trickle-down economics has been proven time and time and time again to deliver nothing for those who are on low incomes, those who are unemployed, the sick, 
the elderly, those who rely on public services. And let's make no mistake, Mr. Ac M Madam Acting Deputy President, that tax cuts today means service cuts tomorrow. What does that mean in reality? Less health care, less funding for education, less support and funding for aged care. The services in this country that, when you're in the midst of a pandemic and an economic crisis, the country needs. $50 billion a year spending tax cuts, $50 billion a year to be spent on tax cuts for the rich people, and yet the unemployed get nothing. And of course, we know that this government has all the way through this pandemic and this crisis chosen men over women. It is women who predominantly have lost their jobs in the midst of this crisis. In those sectors like retail, hospitality, arts, entertainment, tourism. And yet where is the money gone and where is the support gone from this government? It's gone to the jobs for the boys. Mining companies, expanding the gas industry, construction. Every time the Prime Minister can gets up, he talks about helping the tradie. That's right. Mining, Yet it's women in this country who carry the financial burden of this crisis. And what has the government done for them? Nothing. Nothing. These tax cuts predominantly go to high income earners. Who does that mean? Men. This government has made choices today that prioritise the rich over the poor, men over women and millionaires over the unemployed. This is not the type of response we need if we are to get out of this economic crisis. All the economists say that, but the government is blinded by their own ideology. $50 billion a year. Imagine what that money could be spent on if it was invested more wisely. Because this is about choice. And rather than giving money to the rich and leaving the poor with nothing, rather than prioritising high income earners and men over women, rather than prioritising millionaires over the unemployed, imagine what $50 billion a year could do. We could be investing in our education system. We could be making sure our aged care system has well-paid staff to care for our elderly. We could have well-funded hospitals to make sure our health care in the middle of a health crisis actually delivers the services it needs. So I'm strongly opposed to this piece of legislation because the government's choices in this crisis are backwards. Rich over poor, men over women, millionaires over the unemployed. If you want to know what this government stands for, it stands for greed. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I thank uh, all those senators who have contributed uh, to this debate. Uh, this bill is the foundation uh, of our plan to get Australia out of this COVID recession. Uh, it brings forward income tax relief for hardworking Australians by putting more money into their pockets, uh, which uh, will help boost aggregate demand and help uh, facilitate the strongest possible economic and jobs recovery. And it also provides incentives and encouragement to business uh, to invest in their future growth and success because, of course, a growing and successful business will hire more Australians. Uh, I'm grateful uh, to the opposition for having facilitated the passage of these important measures at this, at this time. 
Uh, it's uh, always good when the parties of government come together uh, to act uh, in the national interest, and on that basis I commend uh, this bill to the Senate. The question is, is the bill be read a second time? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells. Stop the bells. The question is that the bills be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Davy, tell her for ayes. Senator Seawitt, tell her for the nose.
Thank you. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 6. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to taxation and for related purposes. Oh, sorry. Yes, you sit up here now. I can't chair this stage. Sorry. Thank you, Senator Boyd. <laughs> Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator McKim. Um, thank you very much, Chair. I'd like to uh, move through uh, the Greens amendments and just to indicate to the Chamber that we won't, won't be seeking to debate these and we'll just make a brief explanation of our amendments and put them as quickly as we can. So I firstly um, move the amendments on sheet uh, 1057. And uh, this amendment uh, uh, registers the Greens' opposition to uh, the bringing forward of uh, the personal tax cuts. And I remind the Senate that uh, for low and middle income earners, their extra $1,000 will disappear in a year, while the very wealthy get to keep their tax cuts forever. And that after a year, 96% of, of the net benefit of these tax cuts goes to the top 30% of income earners, while the bottom 70% of income earners will be left with only 4% of the total benefit, and that these tax cuts hurt women, delivering $2.28 to men for every $1 they deliver to women after this year's sugar hit. So we, uh, uh, as we have repeatedly said, uh, oppose the bringing forward of tax cuts for the very wealthy, and that's what this amendment does. The question is that the Schedule 1 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Division, requ division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bills. Can't close the door. <laughs> um, I call Senator Davy, tell her for the eyes, and Senator Seward, tell her for the nose.
The ayes being 26 and noes 6, the, the motion is carried. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move uh, amendments 1 to 3 on sheet 1056 together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator McKim. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. These uh, amendments would prevent the bringing forward of the stage two tax cuts for people who earn over $1 million every year. It beggars belief that in the middle of the worst recession in a century that we are proposing to give tax cuts to people who earn over a million dollars a year, and we should absolutely be using this money to do a whole range of things, including keeping JobSeeker uh, and JobKeeper in full. And uh, I just cannot understand why the Labor Party, in the middle of the worst recession for a century, would support an accelerated tax cut for millionaires while millions of Australians are unemployed or underemployed. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Vision required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bills. I appoint Senator Seward teller for the eyes and Senator McCarthy teller for the nose.
There being eight ayes and 28 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator McKim. Um, thank you, um, Acting uh, Deputy President. I move uh, the Australian Greens amendments on sheet 1063. And now we're heading into uh, the section of this legislation um, which basically increases the already uh, obscene levels of corporate welfare that the big corporations get um, in this country. I want to be very clear that the Greens do not outright oppose instant asset write-off facilities or the introduction of loss carryback measures, but the government's policy and this legislation taken as a whole fails to be strategic and fails to put these measures together with a more comprehensive suite of reforms that deal with the real structural problems that exist in regards to corporate policy uh, in this country. We may have supported these measures as part of a different package that made them more effective as stimulus measures and more effective as measures to transform the economy, and we're particularly predisposed uh, to support particular measures that would help small business, but we are not interested in facilitating yet more corporate welfare in our country. The question is that, is that Schedule 2 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. I appoint Senator Smith as teller for the eyes and Senator Seawood teller for the nose. Senator Robert, please sit down.
There have been 29 ayes and 6 noes. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator McKim, we won't need to proceed with your amendment on that sheet 1063. But oh, sorry, sorry. Could you say that again, please, Chair? Because that was that um, motion was successful, oh, yeah. we won't need yeah. to proceed with your amendment on that uh, sheet 1063. Yeah, no. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Chair. That is that is fully understood. So I'll now um, move. Uh, Oh, I seek leave to move uh, Greens Amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 1059 together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Chair. These uh, amendments would, uh, if successful, um, uh, ensure that um, assets um, uh, covered by those provisions are required to have been produced or manufactured in Australia. And we hear a lot about uh, you know, buying Aussie made in this place. Well, here's a chance for uh, all senators to uh, give action to that often uh, empty rhetoric that we hear. And I, uh, I note that, uh, that, that that issue, buying Australian, was um, uh, part of uh, the Leader of the Opposition's budget reply speech last night. So here's a Labor uh, here's a chance for the Labor Party to put its money uh, where its mouth was last night and actually do something to, to support Aussie manufacturing. The question is that the amendments be agreed. To oh, Senator Roberts. Am I able to speak to this? Do you want Senator Roberts? I seek leave to, to speak to this. Yes. Thank you. Proceed. The Greens' policies have killed Australian manufacturing. This is nothing but a hypocritical. Uh, virtue signalling charade. I have a good friend in Sydney, John McRae, who has been who's 75 years of age, very well versed about the history of Australia, especially Australian industry. He has taken me through Sydney and shown me, shown me where, where places where factories were making lathes, milling machines, seafood canneries, one after the other in southern Sydney. And that has been killed because of policies driven by the Greens Party, especially energy policy. This is nothing short of a hypocritical stunt. It's nothing short of Greens' virtue signalling. Australian businesses are so short of Australian manufactured machines that they can depreciate, they have to buy overseas because of these guys. And so what we want is when these guys are banning the depreciation of non-Australian assets, they're hurting Australian businesses. They don't even understand that. They don't understand what they're doing to the country at all. So we want farmers, small businesses, large businesses in this country to be able to depreciate the assets they bought. We would want Australian manufacturing, but there is no manufacturing of so many of the assets that Australians have to buy these days. This is cold, thoughtless, shallow. And I call out also, it's also dishonest. And I call out the Liberal National Parties as well because you are following their policies and implementing their policies and destroying Australian manufacturing, the manufacturing of Australian machines. So I will be voting against this and I'm calling on the government to start making government's, governance decisions based on data, hard data, so that we can get this country back again. Instead of hypocrisy, we need democracy. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. A division required. Because we entered into debate, by leave I'd like to ring the bells for one minute. So ring the bells for one minute.
well, not quite, stop the bells. So the question is that the amendment on sheet 1059 be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left, and I appoint Senator Seawert for the ayes and Senator McCarthy for the noes. Thank you. The result of the division is eyes 7, nose 26. Senator McKim. Yes, um, uh, thank you, uh, Acting uh, Deputy President. Um, I seek leave to move Australian Greens Amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 106. O by leave together. Is leave granted? Yeah. Senator McKim. Um, thank you. So these uh, amendments um, would uh, ensure that some uh, assets are made uh, ineligible for, um, for taxpayer assistance, and specifically it would uh, exclude uh, things like coal exploration, mining or extraction or refining or manufacturing of coal products, uh, petroleum extraction, exploration, refining, blending or manufacturing of petroleum products, same for natural gas. Uh, and it would also exclude um, the big arms manufacturers, the, uh, the military, the, the, the military industrial complex um, in this country where we are investing significant amounts of uh, taxpayer benefit that build machines that kill people um, and also would, uh, would uh, exclude um, the tobacco industry um, uh, from uh, this, this, uh, this taxpayer assistance. So uh, we commend these amendments to the Senate. So the question is that amendments listed on sheet 1060 be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. No. Is the division required? Ring the bell for one minute.
question is that amendment on, as detailed on sheet 106 I be agreed to. Uh, I appoint Senator Seawert for the ayes and Senator McCarthy for the noes. The result of the division is I6, nose 28, is affirmed in the negative. Okay. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I move uh, the Australian Greens amendments uh, on um, sheet 1062. Uh, and this relates to um, uh, the Australian Greens uh, opposing uh, the temporary full expensing of uh, depreciating assets. And as I've uh, made clear a couple of times, uh, the Greens may have supported some of the provisions in this legislation if they had been ad adequately targeted, uh, and that is to small business and potentially even up to uh, small and medium enterprise scale, uh, but we simply cannot continue to support uh, the levels of corporate welfare that the major parties, the neoliberal major, pa major parties in this place, um, want to engage in. And uh, I also want to be um, very clear, and this is the final thing I'll say on these amendments, uh, that um, it is an absolute disgrace that this legislation is being jammed through this Senate today, thanks to the collusion of the Liberal National Senators with the Australian Labor Party Senators, without the opportunity for the Senate to do an inquiry to understand the, uh, the true impact of these tens of billions of dollars worth of corporate welfare and tax cuts for the very well off. So the question is that Schedule 7 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells for one minute.
Bells. The question is that Schedule 7 stand as printed. I appoint Senator Seawert for the nose and Senator Dean Smith for the eyes. The result of the division is ayes 27, noes 6. The matter is therefore confirmed in the affirmative. The question now is that the bill stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Okay. The question now is that the bill be reported. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The committee has considered the Treasury Laws Amendment, a tax plan for the COVID-19 Economic Recovery Bill 2020, and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. All those in favour of the committee of the, the report of the committee being adopted, say aye. Those against, say no. The ayes have it. Minister. Uh, I move that the bill be now read a third time. The motion is that the bill be read a third time. All those in favour say aye. Sorry, Senator McKim. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I'll be very brief here, but uh, this legislation uh, relies on the flawed and failed ideologies of neoliberalism and trickle-down economics. We are cooking our planet. We are in the sixth great mass extinction event in the history of our planet, and because of this failed neoliberal trickle-down model, the big corporates and the super-rich are going to make off like bandits, pocketing yet more obscene wealth and yet more levels of taxpayer subsidies, while the people who are doing it the toughest are still waiting for the first drops of this mythical trickle-down to reach their hands. And I also want to point out for members and senators that we are on stolen land. This land was never, ever ceded, and that's why we need a treaty, and that's why, rather than thinking and talking about a Commonwealth, we should be focusing our minds on the stolen wealth. The, the question is that the bill, this bill be now read a third time. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is the bills be read a 
third time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith, teller for the ayes. Senator Seawitt, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 6. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to taxation and for related purposes. Now I understand there's an agreement to call on Senator Seawitt briefly. Senator Seawitt. President, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 807, standing in my name for today, well, today proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seawitt. I, uh, I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now uh, read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. I move oh, that clerk. this. Sorry, I have to call oh, the clerk sorry. first. Bill for an act to amend the law relating to Social Security and for related purposes. Senator Seward. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Seward. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard and to continue my remarks. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Seward. Uh, we will now uh, move on to valedictory statements and I will call the Leader of the Government, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you very much, um, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, on each um, significant occasion for me in this chamber, from the moment I started sitting in that seat right at the back, the moment when I gave my first speech, every budget, my wife Hayley would be in the chamber with me, and that was always very special. Today, she would have liked to have been here, but we live in the sort of times where what seemed entirely straightforward when I first joined this chamber is not straightforward right now. Travel logistics between Perth and Canberra, which were straightforward for a very long time, are anything but. Um, in terms of flight connections, in terms of capacity to re-enter your own state after you come to a place like Canberra. So sadly, my amazing wife, who's carried much of the burden um, for me being able to do this job over the last 13 and a half years, is not here today. And our two beautiful children, Isabel and Charlotte, are not here today. Um, so that is a small regret as I now approach, as I now start to give what is going to be my final speech uh, in this chamber. Mr. President, how good is Australia? <laughs> I, I know that in more recent times this uh, sentence has been uh, assumed by somebody more famous than me. But let me say that for as long as I've lived in Australia, from 
The moment I arrived here in 1996 as a migrant from Belgium, I have often said, how good is Australia? Because this is truly a country where if you, wherever you come from, whatever corner of the world, if you come here with the right attitude and uh, with, um, uh, with an intention to have a go, work hard, do the best you can in whatever your chosen field of endeavor, there is really and truly no limit to what you can achieve in your chosen field of endeavor. And the proof is in the pudding here in the Senate. I mean, we've got a leader of the opposition and a leader of the government who are both first generation Australians from non-English speaking backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, how good is Australia? I don't think that there would be any other country in the world where this would be possible. Mr. President, I have thoroughly loved my time in the Senate. I love this place. I mean, we come here with a whole diversity of perspectives, with different views, with different aspirations, and we represent many, many Australians with different views and aspirations. And in this chamber, we engage in the battle of ideas, we engage in political combat, uh, we, we engage in the personality contest every now and then. But in the end, this is a chamber where on behalf of the nation, by engaging in that policy debate, we are able to achieve a consensus on the best way forward. And, you know, in that process, I've always been uh, a very enthusiastic participant, uh, both uh, in opposition and in government. I found it to be more fun in government, I've got to say. <laughs> and I've <laughs> got to say, well, it's more fun in government. And, and you know, estimates, I mean, I sort of had interjection from the leader of the opposition, uh, uh, Mr. President. I think I might have to take a point of order here. Um, <laughs> my friend Penny. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, there's probably nobody in this parliament with whom I've sparred, uh, you know, more um, vigorously um, and engaged more vigorously in the political battle and the battle of ideas than, Senator, ideas than Senator Wong. And yet, we do have a deep personal friendship, which I'm sure she won't mind me say publicly, and we do trust each other. I mean, how good is it to work that way, where you can not give an inch in terms of fighting for what you believe in, and, but also work with each other to find practical and pragmatic solutions where that is in the interest of the nation. And I know that, I mean, Senator Wong and I, that is always how we both have approached it, and I very much appreciate that um, about you. I mean, we've been on opposite sides uh, in Senate estimates for many, many years, first from opposition and then from government. I've got to say, I enjoy that better from government too. Uh, <laughs> I, I've decided I'm more of a batsman than a bowler. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm happy that I don't have to go back into a bowling session. <laughs> Mr. President, when I came here in uh, 1996, I never thought I'd end up in politics. I mean, you can't plan this. I mean, I thought I'd you know, go and work in a, in a law firm or uh, you know, in a business or whatever, and I tried to get a job um, you know, in Perth where I arrived. And you know, back in you know, the, the mid-90s, the legal fraternity in um, Western Australia was still comparatively protectionist in terms of the capacity of non English-speaking background or non-Australian educated um, law graduates to get into the legal profession. It, it, it intrigued me when years later uh, my wife Hailey started working at Clayton Utes and they were in, in the sort of mid-2000s and people were bending over backwards to facilitate people through the process as quickly as possible from wherever they came and I sort of thought ten years ago, I mean I literally, I mean they said I had to go back to university for another two years after having done six years at university already. And that sort of didn't seem that appealing to me at the time. And so I, I ended up working um, as, a, as a staffer for a politician because that was the only immediately transferable skill where there wasn't any protectionism in place that I could deploy in the short term. Um, 
I mean, that was not necessarily all that straightforward initially either. I mean, there was a you know, former senator, Alan Eggleston, in 1996, um, advertised for an electorate officer, and I applied for that job, and I didn't even get an interview, which I've reminded him, <laughs> which I've reminded him of often since then. <laughs> and I thought, like, there's got to be a, there's got to be a better way. So I, I rang uh, the office of uh, you know, this uh, recently elected senator, Chris Ellison, who recently been made the chair of the treaties committee, and I thought, oh well, um, treaties committee. I've done some public international law. I'm international. Um, treaty sounded international. I thought I'd go and have a meeting with him and see whether I can do some work for him as a volunteer. And <laughs> I think he was a bit intrigued when, I, when this, this uh, guy, I was young, skinny, black hair back then, <laughs> with a German accent, walked in and offered to work as a volunteer. But he took a chance on me and the rest, as I say, is history. I mean, that is how um, I first ended up in the Australian Parliament as a Belgian migrant in October 1996, 24 years ago. And like I've essentially been one way or the other uh, around this place ever since. And it's just been a, an, amazing, an amazing story and an amazing opportunity to contribute um, through like public, to contribute to public service uh, you know, through political service. Now, we all come here with our um, own um, personal political and policy values and perspectives. And um, I'm, my, some of my colleagues have heard me tell this story before, but I think I have to put it on the record here. And in fact, my liberal national colleagues have heard me tell this story yesterday. The thing that really persuaded me to pursue um, the policy and political values um, that are, that are uh, pursued by the Liberal and National Parties uh, is uh, my experience as a student when I reflected you know, at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall on the reason why a, a people who after the Second World War started with the same challenges, opportunities, context, climate, geography, why a people divided by different political and policy choices ended up in such fundamentally different positions when it came to their quality of life, their living standards, um, and, and the, 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 the general opportunities for individuals, their families, and the communities in which they live. And really, I mean, the choices on the western side of the wall, on the western side of, on the, on the western side of Germany, was a choice to pursue policies that supported individual freedom, uh, free enterprise, reward for effort, encouraging people to stretch themselves, take risks, have a go, and all of that underpinned with a social safety net. Uh, they called it the social market economy, the soziale Marktwirtschaft. But the other thing that West Germany did, and that is also something that has always stuck with me, was they opened themselves up to the world, they engaged in open, tried, they, they committed themselves to international competition, they committed themselves to be a, a, an outward-looking, globally focused, open trading economy. And that is where the economic miracle on the western side of Germany came from, that's where the Wirtschaftswunder uh, came from. Whereas on the eastern side, where you had uh, policy choices and a political system that focused on socialism and um, equality of outcomes, uh, which sort of ultimately led to the lowest common denominator um, focus, people ended up in comparative poverty. And you know, in the end, I mean, you know, the wall only was built in 1961. So from 1949, they were on different trajectories. By 1961, the wall had to be built to keep people on one side in the system because people didn't want to spontaneously stay there. And then 28 years later, even the wall wasn't enough to keep people in because ultimately, people have a thirst for freedom. And the wall came down. And, but it's the other thing that I learned was the power of the trajectory. Now, you know, commentators and political opponents at various times have laughed at me when I talk about the power of the trajectory. But think about this. Like, I mean, you might, I mean, the, the people of East Berlin wouldn't have noticed on day one or two or five that they were on a different trajectory to the people of West Berlin. But when you're on a different trajectory for 40 years and you're making bad choices as opposed to good choices. When you look back after 40 years, the destination you end up in can be fundamentally different. 
And some people have said, oh, well, that's because, you know, on one side it was a dictatorship and it was uh, an auth autocratic political system. And that's why people weren't enjoying the same living standards. That fails to understand what is cause and what is effect. The reason the system became more and more dictatorial and more and more autocratic was because they had to exercise more and more control on those people who didn't want to spontaneously live in a system that um, restricted their freedoms. And fast forward to Australia. I mean, Australia in the 1980s, in the era uh, post the Hawke and Keating governments, the Howard governments and subsequent governments leading all the way to the Morrison government now, since Australia has made a decision to open ourselves up to the world to be a, a, a globally focused, open, trading economy, we have gone from strength to strength. Our, we've gone through a period of nearly 30 years of continuous growth on the back of making the difficult decisions some 40, nearly 40 years ago of opening ourselves up to global competition. Yes, there have been difficult transitions and of course it wasn't all easy, but it has made Australia stronger, more prosperous and has given the Australian people better opportunities to get ahead and to have the best possible uh, living standards. And international competition can be uncomfortable. And you know, this is a debate that is taking place in the world now. I mean, you know, there can be a temptation to say, wouldn't it be so much more comfortable if we protect ourselves from uh, global competition and if we put fences around various activities so that people don't have to um, worry about being challenged. The problem with that is, just by putting a fence around something, just by protecting something, doesn't mean that the innovation and the competitive forces elsewhere stop. All it means is that you lose touch with where the rest of the world is at. All it means is that you fall further behind. So, as we work on getting out of this COVID recession, we've got to make sure as a nation that we continue to remember what has made us so strong over 30 years of continuous growth. And it, it has been a genuine commitment, which has been a bipartisan commitment to Australia as a globally focused, open trading economy. And that has been over 30 years so far, and it will be in the future, be the best way for Australia to offer the best possible opportunities for Australians today and into the future to get ahead. Mr. President, um, during my time in uh, this chamber in opposition and in government, I've been involved in a whole series of policy battles and um, you win some, you lose some, uh, but I've always uh, been an enthusiastic and vigorous uh, contributor in those various uh, debates and battles. And I guess what I've, the other thing I've learned in this place is that sometimes uh, what you are able to stop um, can be as important as what uh, you are able to put in place. And, you know, one of the proud moments of my uh, career and, uh, was uh, to be able to put the detailed and forensic scrutiny over the anti-WI mining tax, yeah. uh, which um, I previous government uh, sought uh, to uh, impose, 99% of the revenue of which was going to come out of one jurisdiction. And uh, it is a moment of great personal pride that we uh, were able to um, repeal that particular legislation on coming uh, into government. But of course, I mean, I've always looked at, um, when in coming into Parliament, I, I've always looked at the period in opposition as the training period to prepare you in the best possible way uh, to be able to make a meaningful contribution uh, in government if and when you get the opportunity to serve in government. And, you know, in the Senate, I, I got to say, the Senate estimates process is an amazing way to be trained as a future contributor in executive government because uh, you get to know all the people, you get to know all the issues, and if you apply yourself to asking uh, you know, all of the 
possible questions, it is an amazing way to get across a lot of details. And you know, it's, 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 the, it's the ultimate um, on-the-job uh, university level training, um, I, I would say. And so on coming uh, into government in 2013, you know, and looking back since 2013, I am proud that as a government, we have been able to repair the budget uh, to the point where by 2018-19, a great budget, the 2018-19 budget, uh, Prime Minister, uh, where by the, by the time of 2018-19, uh, we had returned the budget back into balance. We have, over the period between 2013 and 2023, prior to the coronavirus crisis hitting us, we, we had passed and implemented uh, budget bottom line improvements to the tune of $250 billion. So what that means is the bottom line would have been $250 billion worse off over that period if we hadn't made the decisions and hadn't legislated the decisions that we've put forward in uh, various budgets. Now I've been involved in seven budgets, seven half yearly budget updates, uh, eight final budget outcomes, a couple of pre-election economic and fiscal outlooks, and though <laughs> that is a pretty involved process. I mean, every budget, every half yearly budget update, Simon, you'll find out, <laughs> it's, um, it's a lot of meetings. Uh, in rooms without windows, it's a lot of paper, papers to read through, it's a lot of conversations with colleagues, it's a lot of um, conversations within the Expenditure Review Committee with a view of trying to make the best possible decision for the future of Australia. Now, and, and it's a fine balance. You want to make decisions to allocate resources where that is appropriate, as much as necessary, as little as possible. Uh, Simon, uh, you want to uh, make sure that um, the expenditure is effective in, in achieving uh, the uh, policy objective that you're pursuing um, as a government. Um, but you also are always very mindful that if we, um, if we, if we don't get this prioritisation right, there are real consequences for real people. And so, in, in particular in this year, 2020, as we were hit with the coronavirus crisis and we had to make some of the decisions on uh, things like job keeper, job seeker, and, 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 and so on. I mean, we were very, very, very conscious, and it was, it was mentally and emotionally uh, really a, a quite a heavy burden uh, to, to really think through what this uh, meant uh, for, for real people. Over this period, my, uh, the uh, successful legislation of personal income tax cuts in 2018 and 2019 to the value now of $350 billion, putting more money into workers' pockets, helping to stimulate the economy and generate growth by boosting aggregate demand. That is you know, one of my personal highlights in terms of legislation going through the Senate during this period. I mean, it was quite hotly contested the first two times. It was comparatively easy today um, to bring uh, these um, income tax cuts forward, various savings bills. One, one of the things I just want to reflect on, and this is something where the Coalition and the Greens came together, Senate voting reforms. Before we, before we reformed the Senate voting systems, there was this lottery where uh, somehow uh, the 97 per cent of people who voted one above the line immediately lost control of their preferences, and those preferences were traded by so-called preference whisperers who were doing deals behind closed doors which weren't transparent at all. And the reforms that we passed were reforms that empowered voters to not only determine where their first preference goes if voting above the line, but also where their second, third and subsequent preferences would go above the line. Uh, so instead of having people uh, get um, elected into the Senate with very low number of votes, whatever our views on the views of individual senators represented in this, in, in this chamber now, the people who are here are here because a sufficient number of Australians back them in. And they are here because they reflect the views and aspirations of a sufficient number of Australians, not because of some accidental um, lottery based on a backroom uh, deal. And, you know, 40 hours of debate, including one through the night, um, from, I think we started on a Thursday afternoon at 4.35 o'clock and we went to 2 o'clock 
the next afternoon straight. And the Labour Party was running a roster against me. <laughs> With um, every every hour, I think we had uh, we had quorum calls and we had uh, you know mo like um, motions to uh, suspend the Senate and <laughs> everybody turned up. And this is where I've got to say. What a fantastic team uh, I've had the privilege to work with here in the Senate. Uh, you know, we've, we've been involved in many battles for the nation and we've, we've won many good battles for the nation that will put Australia on a stronger foundation trajectory for the future for some time uh, to come. Um, I'm proud of my work, which is perhaps not as well known, but Senator Wong knows about. Uh, the, uh, Australian-Germany Advisory Group. Uh, one of the jobs I was given by uh, Prime Minister Abbott in uh, 2014 at the G20 Leaders Summit when we had a bilateral meeting with Chancellor Merkel was to co-chair this group, the Australia-Germany Advisory Group, uh, to explore ways to broaden, deepen and strengthen the bilateral relationship with Germany. Now, you know, Germany, uh, the biggest economic power in Europe, the fourth biggest economic power in the world, um, we had friendly relations, but we didn't really, we weren't really top of mind with each other. It was a very long distance. And, I mean, Germany is a very important economy in Europe, and Europe is a very important economy, and perhaps one that historically we accessed primarily, primarily through uh, the United Kingdom because of obvious historical uh, ties. But the work that we did to strengthen our relationship with Germany and with France and, and with other countries on the continent will stand us in good stead moving forward as we now are pursuing a trade agreement separately with uh, the European Union and with the United Kingdom post uh, the um, Brexit vote in the UK. I'm going to go just quickly mindful of time and not wanting to hold everybody up for too long. But at a WI level, other than being able to um, get rid of the mining tax, you know, GST reform and the reform of GST sharing arrangements, making sure that we delivered a fairer, better deal for Western Australia, uh, in a way that was good for the country, that encouraged and facilitated stronger national growth and was also good for every other state because we uh, calibrated the uh, arrangement such that no other state was worse off. In fact, states were better off. And that is, that is a real credit uh, to uh, Scott Morrison as treasurer uh, who worked with his uh, liberal colleagues from WI and who, who worked really hard and really smart to come up with a creative way of delivering the outcome and the people of Western Australia will be forever grateful uh, for the work you did uh, there, Prime Minister. And let me say, um, the West Australian State Government, my, my good friend, uh, the Treasurer of Western Australia, Ben White, uh, delivered his budget in Western Australia yesterday and he delivered a $1.2 billion surplus. $1.2 billion surplus. Not bad in the pandemic, I guess. Um, but you know how much the GST top-up payment uh, is as a result of our reforms? this financial year, $1.5 billion. So a $1.2 billion surplus and a $1.5 billion GST top-up payment, courtesy of the Morrison reforms to the GST sharing arrangements. So I mean, that puts it very starkly, I thought. With my colleagues, I've also been proud to have been able to uh, help deliver a, a fair share of um, in federal infrastructure funding for the great state of Western Australia. I want to just now turn to the marriage law, law postal survey for a moment, if, if you don't mind. For the entire period that I've been uh, in this parliament, um, the issue of um, marriage equality kept popping back up it, it, and it was never resolved. And it became increasingly divisive in the community and there was clearly a very strong push to resolve this issue uh, and to uh, get it dealt with once and for all. And Across the Australian community, there was, among good, reasonable, good Australians, a diversity of views, which was not easily reconcilable. Good Australians can legitimately have a different perspective on this, and we needed to find a way to resolve this issue once and for all for the nation in a way that kept the nation together. And I know there was a big push that this should just be dealt with by a vote in Parliament without consulting the Australian people. Let me tell you, I am proud for the role that I've been able to play to facilitate the effective professional conduct of the Australian Marriage Law Postal Service through the IBS, which did an outstanding job 
in helping to deliver it. The result is there, was there for all to see. And the result, I believe, helped achieve that reform in a way that had public support. If the parliament had imposed this on the Australian people, there would have always been one side of the community that would have resented that change having been imposed. Having made that decision the way we have, the reform was achieved, but in a way that kept the nation together. Mr. President, <laughs> this has been an amazing opportunity to serve my country, the country that I chose to make my home. All of us come here with the support of a whole range of different people, but fundamentally our parties, selectors, and the people vote for us at elections. I, I would like to thank the West Australian Liberal Party for the trust they've put in me, a non-English speaking background a migrant who'd been in the country for less than 11 years at the time. I promised that I would give it my best. I hope that you agree that I have. When I got here, um, I was here at the tail end of the Howard government and I just thought, wow, this is just amazing. How, how did I end up in this party room with John Howard? I mean, absolute giant. I mean, and somebody that I deeply admired. But then we went through a period in opposition. Brendan Nelson, fine Australian, great Australian. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull, with whom I had a very good personal and working relationship. Much has been written, but I think the Prime Minister would agree. Peter Dutton, my friend Peter Dutton would agree, that during the period of his leadership, we all worked very hard to help make him the most successful Prime Minister he could possibly be. And a lot of good things were achieved during that period. A lot of good things were achieved during that period. Tony Abbott, who nearly won the election for us in 2010, worked so hard, who did win the election in 2013, like obviously a man of strong convictions and who first put me into the cabinet. Uh, I will forever be grateful for the opportunities that he's given, given me. Scott Morrison. Scott and I, we are very close friends. We have worked together exceptionally well. So don't believe all of the stuff that you read in the media. We are very, very good friends. Mm -hmm. And yes, we engage in debates on policy. And we don't always agree. Newsflash, in politics, you look at issues and you have ideas on the best way forward and how to resolve things and you, you sort of in, with the overlay of your political values and, and from time to time you have different perspectives and you, the debate that you engage in brings you to a better way forward. And that is actually the way the system is meant to work. That is the way the expenditure review committee is meant to work, the cabinet is meant to work. The reason cabinet discussions are confidential is so that you can openly engage and robustly engage in this sort of debate because that is how you end up with the best possible decisions for your country. And it is true that Scott and I on occasions have had robust conversations on policy. But we've always been close and trusted friends you know, in this endeavor as we seek to achieve the best outcomes for our nation. And let me say, as I'm leaving this place, I'm feeling comfortable in the knowledge that Scott Morrison is leading a strong and united and cohesive team. The, the strongest, most united and most cohesive team that I've been a part of since I've been in this parliament on our side of politics. And so, uh, you know, as I become citizen Corman, uh, Prime Minister, I wish you and your government all the very best uh, in, into the future. I also want to thank Bridget, Senator McKenzie, as leader of the Nationals. Um, you know, again, we are two different parties and from time to time we have different perspectives on different issues, and, but we've always worked together 
exceptionally well and you know, with the, the right sort of overall attitude and commitment to finding solutions and I really very much thank you for the way you have engaged with me. In fact, I would like to thank all of my um, Liberal National colleagues for having supported me through my endeavours. Um, I would like to thank every Senator in this chamber. I, I have thoroughly enjoyed engaging with all of you and I thoroughly respect and value the work you do for our nation. Um, I, I, it is your job to go hard for what you believe in. It is your job to engage in the debates that you engage in and I know that you will continue to, to do so. And let me just say, uh, Penny, I do hope that we'll stay in touch even uh, when after we've left uh, this, this place. Crossbench, I've had a great diversity of uh, people on the crossbench over the years. Steve Fielding, Nick Xenophon, Glenn Lazarus, um, um, Senator Lambie, uh, Senator Roberts, Senator Hansen, you know, of course, you know, all our good friends in the Greens over the years with Senator Bob Brown was the leader when I got here, Senator Milne, Senator Di Natale and now of course Senator Waters. Um, I have always, you know, sought to find a way to find common ground even when that initially appeared somewhat impossible. Um, you know, Senator Patrick is, you know, <laughs> knows how persistent I can be in trying to find common ground. Um, and I, I really, I, I thank all of you, Senator Lionham, Senator Dye, there's been quite a, quite a long list of different, um, different crossbench perspectives over the years. But let me say, it's been such a privilege to work with every single one of you and I, I will be watching you from a distance and, um, and um, wishing you all the best. I've also had, I've been very, I've been blessed with the great staff that I've had during my time in, uh, in office. Slide, Senator Slide Brockman was my chief of staff in opposition for most of my period in opposition and um, we've done some great things together and you know here he is, he's now making his uh, own contribution in his own right and he's doing a magnificent job in particular across uh, regional Western Australia. I've had three chiefs of staff in government, Simon Atkinson who's gone to better and higher things but made an outstanding contribution in my office during my first three years as finance minister and an exceptional public servant um, and I'm sure that uh, he has got much further to go uh, under governments of either persuasion and I wish you very well. Uh, Belinda Pola, um, an outstanding uh, professional uh, who uh, decided to go back to Queensland to have a family but uh, made a great contribution in my office for quite some time. And Chris Brown, uh, who I think is here somewhere. Ah, at the back, yeah. Who, who has held the fort for some time now. Um, I, I first, saw, um, I mean he doesn't know this, but I first picked him as a future staffer when I first saw him at a young liberal function in 2008. I thought this guy is talented. And, uh, and then by 2015 there was an opportunity and I snatched him. And uh, he's, done a, he's done a great job um, in my office. I, I just, it's hard to go through, I don't want to go through a whole shopping list of um, names and I hope that my other very hardworking staff members will forgive me by just lim limiting it to a few. But um, Natasha Lobo, my EI in Perth, has worked with me, you know, she, I first hired her in 1997. And she's been with me in my uh, WI Senate uh, office for the entire period. Um, just an amazing support and uh, amazing loyalty over so many years. And of course, uh, Karen Wu, who has worked for seven years as the senior media advisor in government. And I mean, that's a tough job. Um, and so thank you very much for your service over that time. And Philippa Campbell, who um, is, uh, she, she came to me after a long period in um, Peter Costello's office and so she knew a lot of um, what I needed to know when I started in this job and has been an amazing support. Secretaries in my department, I had the privilege of being the minister for the best department in the Commonwealth. Prime Minister, finance is the best department in the Commonwealth. Simon, finance is the best department in the Commonwealth. You're, you're close enough to the center without being right at the center. Like, you're close enough to being able to help shape the decisions and the directions without being entirely on the front line. 
Um, and you've got a group of professionals in the department that are just outstanding. And I mean, David Tune uh, was there to settle me in uh, when, when I arrived, and I did know him out of the estimate spirit. Um, and you know, he, he was very generous to me in sort of, I guess, teaching me the ropes as a new minister initially. Uh, Jain Holton, uh, the formidable Jain Holton, um, like, uh, you know, deployed all of her energy and uh, passion to, uh, you know, taking me to another level. And Rosemary Huxtable, um, just an amazing uh, world-class public servant. Um, it's been such a privilege to work with you over the entire period. Rosemary was the Deputy Secretary uh, Budget in Finance when I arrived, um, and we did our first few budgets uh, from, from that position, and in more recent years, uh, became the secretary of, of the department and um, you know Rosemary uh, I really value the work uh, that we've been able to do together to help put our nation on the best possible foundation and trajectory for the future. I would also like to thank the clerks who in opposition in particular have been so helpful in boosting my training to give the government of the day at the time the hardest possible time. And you know, all of the tricks that I learned in opposition from the clerks, um, I, knew, I knew how to defend myself against when we were in government, which was fantastic. Not always, but you know, perhaps a bit better than I otherwise might have. The, ch the chamber attendants here who are always unfailingly courteous, uh, I mean, this has been just such a great workplace. And I mean, everybody just makes a tick in such a nice and friendly and Curtis fashion. But I would like to finish by firstly thanking uh, my parents for the opportunity they've given me as a child growing up. I'm not your typical liberal background politician. I mean, my parents are working class. My mum was a full-time mum. My dad was a factory worker. He got sick. He ended up on a, a disability pension. Like, we had four, they had four kids. Um, by the time they were 28, uh, it wasn't sort of plain sailing, but they bent over backwards to give me opportunity, and for that, I will forever be grateful. And I would like to say, I, I would like to finish by saying a very sincere thank you to Hailey. Hailey is an outstanding woman. She's an amazing individual. She's obviously my life's partner and best friend. She's an amazing mother to our beautiful children, Isabel and Charlotte. But she's an outstanding professional woman with a distinguished career in her own right. I mean, she was the president of the Law Society in WI at age 35, and I'm so proud of what Hailey has achieved now working at the bar in Perth, and to observe the respect in which she's held by her colleagues and her peers in that profession. And Hailey had to build her career throughout that entire period while I was mostly away. During the seven years as finance minister, I was essentially over East every week from the middle of January to the middle of December, every week. And, you know, we had two kids, Hailey had her own career, I was over here, so she has carried a, a very substantial burden for me being able to uh, pursue this opportunity and provide to do this job, and I, I will forever be grateful for that. Um, thank you very much, Hailey. So colleagues, this is my last contribution uh, from this chair in this uh, chamber. There is probably more that I could or should have said, but uh, I think the hour is uh, advancing. Um, I give you this uh, commitment. After today, I won't be back. <laughs> Senator Wong.
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, well, I rise on this, the valedictory of my friend and colleague, Matthias Cormann, uh, and wish to say a few words personally, but also on behalf of the Labor Party as he leaves uh, this chamber. When Matthias announced his intention to resign, I put out a statement in which I said he was a formidable opponent, a trusted counterpart and a parliamentarian of the old school. So I'm going to go through those briefly. First, we'll start with formidable opponent. When I was a minister, you see, I'm not from WA, so I didn't sort of engage with it, him on the plane, etc. First thing I remember about um, Matthias, I was kind of engaged in climate policy, which was not the easiest ministerial job to start with. Um, was this bloke with a German accent who kept asking me questions, started asking me questions and then started following me around at estimates, not in a stalking sense, but in turning up, in turning up to estimates. I like, who is this bloke? Anyway, we did have a, a quite a lot, at, lot of interchanges at estimates. Um, he subsequently said to me when he became a minister and he wasn't answering questions that he'd learnt a lot about how not to really answer the questions from me when I was a minister, but I think that is a vicious, vicious calumny. Uh, definitely untrue. Um, our combat has been pretty hard at times. Um, uh, I think uh, it's generally not been personal or churlish. He did once try calling me Australia's worst finance minister. I pointed out to him that my net debt was lower, my gross debt was lower, my tax to GDP ratio was lower. Uh, and, uh, he didn't keep going with it, although he keeps going occasionally with uh, the same sort of exaggerated position that the coalition had to put in place to justify the 2014 budget. Uh, but notwithstanding the results of this budget, I'm not going to return the favour of the moniker. <laughs> so I don't think that's a practice we should continue. Um, I knew he was a. I didn't know Matthias well when we were in uh, government. He was in opposition. Um, and, but I do remember one rather untoward uh, event at Estimates where I realised he must be a reasonably decent man. And I don't wish to embarrass the particular other senator, but I got meowed at in Estimates and got quite a bit of media. He like, subsequently apologised and that we all moved on. But I just remember Matthias sitting there, just almost with his hand in his mouth, not saying anything. And I thought, well, maybe this bloke is actually decent. Um, <laughs> I described him as a trusted counterpart. He is. He's a decent man and he's an honourable man. Uh, I'm sure he would be the first to say he's made mistakes at times. But I don't think between us we have ever breached a confidence. Uh, and we have always sought to honour our commitments to each other. I have valued that greatly. There's not many people about whom you can say that in politics. Uh, and it has been a, um, a great, something I have valued greatly. I also described him as a parliamentarian of the old, of the old school. I just want to talk briefly about what I meant when I said that. The first is, I think, and we saw it again today in his contribution, though I noticed he didn't acknowledge the German Social Democratic Party and his, our sister party and his contribution about the war. But leaving that aside, um, he has a belief in democracy. And a belief in democracy is more than just words. It's a respect for institutions. It demands a respect for norms and conventions, a respect for this parliament. And Matthias brings that to his job. Sometimes I think he, as I said yesterday, should have answered more questions. Or, but he does understand that as much as our constitution and our history, our democracy depends on what we do here and how we behave here. I think one thing we share is a belief in the importance of containing conflict. Now, that might sound to those opposite a little odd coming from Penny Wong, <laughs> but it's actually so important. Politics is, as some have said, 
war by other means. It's what we do to resolve conflict. We don't have revolutions, we don't get out guns, we don't become vigilantes. We fight here. Uh, and there must be limits. There must be limits. There must be containment. Because conflict without any limit risks destroying too much, risks damaging the polity, the people, the community, the institution too much. And that is one thing uh, I think Matthias and I have shared, an understanding of what we wanted to fight about but what we wanted to make sure we, we, we didn't fight about. Some of those limits are set by our, our democratic traditions, by our democratic system, by norms, conventions. Some of them should be set by decency. Things like the, you know, the limitations around personal attacks, an understanding that disengagement is sometimes required, and on some issues that we shouldn't be partisan. And there are many um, examples I could give of times where I think, regardless of our very different views on some issues, where we would have conversations which were about we need to make sure there's bipartisanship on this. We need to make sure there's a limited conflict on this. Um, one of them that I remember, because it meant a lot to me because of my history and my experience of racism when I was young, was after the phrasing Anning comments. And people might recall we had a bipartisan motion. And I remember ringing uh, Matthias from out the back next to the kids' trampoline, um, and I said, it would be really good if we could move this together, this motion. It would say something. But there's a lot of conflict and we can do a lot of people can do a lot of politics about it, but you know, people need to hear a defence of multiculturalism and the assertion of inclusion from us both. It's not the only thing we've worked on uh, together. Some of the things I'm on a bound to keep between us. <laughs> But it, it, it was important, and um, you heard Matthias start today with, or Senator Cormann start today with a, um, a discussion about us both having um, a migrant background, him, him much more, much later in life, obviously. Um, but I think that has informed some of what we understand to be outside of the zone of desirable conflict in a democracy. Um, I will uh, miss our contest, I'll miss our catch-ups and the very good red wine, I'll miss our friendship, although I too hope we uh, maintain that beyond this. I'll miss sharing photos and stories of our children across the table during question time. I want to acknowledge your contribution to the nation and to the parliament. I wish more of it had been in opposition. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, want to say to Hayley, um, I want to thank Hayley for her contribution to the nation, but also that I reckon he's been pretty lucky and he's got a lot better um, um, uh, with your influence. Um, to Isabel and Charlotte, um, yeah, it's wonderful you to have, to have your father back in a different way. Um, so uh, I wish you well personally for all that lies beyond uh, and thank you uh, for your friendship and for your contribution. You. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And I too rise uh, this afternoon. Uh, with both enormous respect and uh, a touch of sadness, uh, to pay tribute to my friend and colleague, Senator the Honourable Matthias Cormann. Uh, more than 12 years ago, when I entered this place, I took up my place beside you as a fellow senator for the great state of Western Australia. Uh, now I stand here today contributing to your valedictory, and I can genuinely say that over the years in this place, you have been a true friend, and I thank you for both your friendship and your steadfast representation of the values that you and I hold so dear. Matthias, in your more than 13 years in this place, 
uh, you have left a mark that few others will ever emulate. Your achievements in this place and your service to our nation's well-being will have an impact for decades to come. Your legacy will be enduring. Uh, colleagues, in Matias's maiden speech in 2007, he said this. This is a country where, if you put your shoulder to the wheel, work hard, embrace the people and values, and become an integral part of the community. In short, if you have a go, there is no limit to what you can achieve in a chosen field of endeavour. We all come to this place with a commitment to make a positive difference. Other than our energy and our enthusiasm, we bring to the table our background, our experiences and our values. And Matthias, yours is without a doubt a great Australian story and one that should inspire anyone from any background who wants to succeed. You came here as an immigrant in your 20s. You embraced your new home. You've made a valuable contribution to our country through an incredible amount of hard work. 25 hours a day, eight days a week. That's just how you work. But it is this commitment and determination, and I think my colleagues will agree when I say, no matter how frustrating for the rest of us when we receive a text from you at midnight on a Sunday <laughs> and you expect a timely response, uh, it is that commitment and dedication uh, that has seen you succeed in everything you do. Over our last few months, as our nation has faced the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, as Finance Minister, you as part of the team knew what needed to be done to provide the support to drive the economic recovery. Uh, your work as our Finance Minister, as the Prime Minister himself has stated, for seven years saw our nation enter COVID-19 in a far stronger position than what it was. It therefore allowed us to bring forward initiatives such as the JobKeeper payment, the JobKeeper supplement, the Supporting Apprentices and Trainees initiative and the many, many other initiatives which will help our economic recovery. For me, it is a personally bittersweet moment that you are leaving this place. I am so pleased for your new opportunity as Australia's candidate for the Secretary-General of the OECD. You will make, if elected, an incredibly valuable contribution not only to promote growth but also opportunity across the globe. As a fellow Western Australian Liberal Senator, we have been a united team since that meeting back in 2006. It was 7am and we met at the then famous Bar One on St George's Terrace in Perth for breakfast and, as Matthias liked to call it, a chat. That chat, though, ultimately changed the course of both of our lives. And here we are in 2020. I can honestly say that supporting you in your pre-selection was one of the best decisions I've ever made. And we've had our backs ever since. And in fact, colleagues, every year since I was elected, uh, many of you will know that Matthias and I have held the Cormann Cash Annual State Council Christmas Function. This year we hold our 13th and our final. And boy, it will be a big night. Uh, Matthias, your achievements in this place are extensive. You have been an effective senator, passionately representing the interests of our great state. You may not have been born in Western Australia, but you are without a doubt a sand groper, through and through. It was your leadership of our WA team and your constant advocacy that ensured Western Australia did get a fair deal and now gets a fair deal when it comes to DST distribution. And uh, all of the WA team, many of whom have joined us here today, uh, were proud to stand and fight with you. For many years to come, this is something that our great state will not forget and it will continue to have a positive impact in Western Australia. In your leadership roles, you have well and truly mastered this place as Senator Wong herself acknowledged, whether it was working behind the scenes with colleagues within the government, reaching out and working with the opposition, the crossbench and the Australian Greens. When it comes to your role as finance minister, there is no question that you have consistently followed the principles you laid out in your maiden speech of free enterprise, individual freedom, personal responsibility, reward for effort, low taxation, less regulation and incentives for people to stretch themselves and to reach their full potential. The reason you are so successful is your incredible work ethic 
and the fact that, again, as Senator Wong herself articulated, you treat all senators regardless of their political affiliation with respect. In your maiden speech to this place, you also said, politics at its best is a noble profession. It is a noble pursuit. And in your case, history will record that you have carried yourself with great nobility. As we all know, it is often said that one of the greatest achievements in politics is to leave at a time of your choosing and on your own terms. And my friend, you are doing exactly that. You leave this place with an outstanding record of service and an achievement to undertake a new opportunity to serve both our nation and the world. Matthias, we will all miss your contribution in this place, and I will certainly miss you as a colleague and a friend. I wish you all the best in your next chapter, but in particular, as Senator Wong said, uh, with Hayley, Charlotte and Isabel. And I conclude by saying farewell, good and faithful servant of Western Australia and indeed Australia generally. Matthias, my friend, thank you. Senator Mackenzie. Much, Mr. President, and um, I rise as leader of the Nationals in the Senate and join everybody here. And the fact that it's a valedictory and we've still got uh, the stands packed, I think, is a testament to the man whose valedictory um, we're participating in today. You are so patriotic, Matthias, for your adopted nation. You're a senator's senator, and you know. We want to make sure there's more of those around. Um, your contribution to the parliament, to the coalition and to our nation has been significant, and I'm looking forward to it continuing um, in another role. You've been leader, in the government, um, leader of the government in the Senate since 2017, and it's been my great honour as deputy leader of the Nationals to sit in that leadership group heading in to the 2019 election and again to have worked with you uh, post-election as the leader of the Nationals. And I think it's your integrity, uh, your trust, your value system that has allowed, and your sense of humour at times, and your patience, um, to really mean that we can get the results um, that, we need, that we need to. Um, national, former national leaders Warren Trust, Barnaby Joyce, uh, current DPM Michael McCormack uh, have all spoken highly about working with you in their, their former roles, and as has Nigel Scallion, another Senate leader you've worked with, and Nashi. I spoke to Warren Trust, former Deputy Prime Minister, uh, earlier today, and he uh, was unequivocal. He believes you're the most outstanding finance minister that we've seen, your attention to detail, the fact that you're across your brief um, and that you approach negotiations rationally, calmly and reasonably. You don't always win, he said, with Matthias, but you know you've had a fair hearing and so thank you for the work that you do that. Whether negotiating the fuel excise or championing our live uh, export and mining sector, the National Party uh, and Senator Cormann saw eye to eye on many, many issues. Uh, and I think it's his rock-solid commitment as a true coalitionist. Can't say that about everybody in the Liberal Party, but for Matthias Cormann, a true coalitionist, uh, because he understands that together the Liberal Party and the National Party provide a strong, stable government uh, for our nation, uh, and that's the best, best outcome in the national interest. The mining sector that you championed for WA just wasn't for WA, and we Nationals uh, want to thank you for your um, attention to that. But all, it's sage advice to always pay attention to the smartest guy in the room. He can be your friend and supporter or not, <laughs> and it's always best, I think, and Senator, you always display um, a commitment to try and be the former. Your unwavering commitment um, to bettering the lives of all Australians, and I think you spoke earlier about um, your upbringing and, and what role that's played in the value system and the worldview that you've brought to this place, and I think we are all the richer for hearing that here. Um, you've, been, you've been a rock-like figure for the coalition ever since you've come to parliament, and we are going to severely miss you. Um, we mentioned estimates briefly. Uh, what I love about watching Matthias in estimates, and again, it's like being schooled, um, he's got an army of public servants. Every, every seat behind him is taken up. 
Rosemary's there. She's got all the folders. Um, but he takes every question and he can answer them. He's across the detail. And that is exactly how this process is meant to work. And it is an incredible privilege to watch you um, on FPA. We're X generations. I do want to share, you know, when some of those late night sittings um, with former Senator Fifield, Cashy, <laughs> Parry. Um, we had some good tunes. Uh, it was uh, all good fun. But I think, Matthias, what you have brought here has provided, I think, um, in my experience, some of the great moments of, of this chamber. And Penny mentioned, Senator Wong mentioned one earlier. It is both of your ability to come together on really key significant moments, um, such as around racism. That was one of the most powerful moments I think this chamber has ever seen, and it was a great privilege to be able to sit here and see both of you. So be proud of our nation for sending you both, and then proud of you both as individuals uh, for giving us as senators that moment in our nation. Um, so yes, you do show us what this chamber is capable through that. And I think, Matthias, your commitment as a senator, senator to the traditions and values of this chamber. Um, and you've got a partner uh, in, in this Leader of the Opposition that has helped you to um, fulfil that. I'm just going to recite a poem um, at the moment—I'm nearly finished—that uh, I think describe, may describe Matthias's approach to poli politics. Um, Panic bells, it's red alert. There's something here from somewhere else. The war machine springs to life, opens up one eager eye, focusing it on the sky. Where 99 red balloons go by. <laughs> 99 Decision Street, 99 ministers meet to worry, worry, super scurry. Sounds like budget prep. Call the troops out in a hurry. That's the cell. Uh, this is what we've waited for. This is it, boys. This is the war. The president's on the line as 99 red balloons go by. He is a coalition to, coalitionist to the core, and that requires true respect and mutual appreciation that there are two independent parties here, Matthias, and that is the key to your success in that role, and I look forward to working with Bermo uh, to that end. It is also your pragmatic and rational approach to policy decisions. When you stood up in your first speech as a fresh-faced newcomer in August 2007 and you thanked the then President, uh, President Ferguson from South Australia, for his advice and wisdom, I'll lift a few lines from that young Western Australian senator. Thank you for the advice and wisdom that you've shared with me in the time that we've sat in this chamber. I very much appreciated the generosity towards me as a new senator and me as a leader. And in more recent times, I'm sincerely grateful to have the privilege to work alongside you. I've always admired your passion, your commitment to our Liberal and National Party coalition, and respect you, your directness in standing up for what you believe in and bring those values here uh, as a conviction politician. All the best. Now I'm going to try, not in German, but bon chance, uh, for the next chapter. Senator Waters. President, and I rise on behalf of the Australian Greens to acknowledge Senator Cormann and his uh, work and enormous contribution to this place over many, many years. Having only recently stepped into the role of leader in the Senate for the Greens and in a year when we've all uh, been here less than we otherwise would, I've not had the opportunity to engage with you closely. Uh, our, po our politics are poles apart, but across the political spectrum you're seen as a straight talker, no nonsense someone who is extremely bright across your brief uh, and always um, working very, very hard. You're also praised as a strong neg negotiator, much as we sometimes don't like the outcomes that you negotiate. Uh, our chamber will certainly miss someone so erudite that they can respond in multiple languages at the drop of a hat, as you did yesterday. Um, I must say I won't miss you rejecting the premise of my questions, uh, <laughs> but I do respect your conviction and your work ethic. Uh, I've also been in touch with uh, former uh, Greens leader Senator Richard Di Natale, who asked me to pass on some sentiments from him. Richard said that despite having very different political philosophies, you had his respect and his trust. He wishes you the very best in your next phase of life and assures you that you won't regret it. Um, as a senator and uh, a minister from Perth, with all the travel that, that that entails, 
uh, I'm sure that you'll enjoy some extra time with your family, very well earned, and your words about your family were very touching. We wish you all the very best. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, in adding to the many fine words said about our friend and colleague, Senator Matthias Cormann, I want to focus on just a few brief points. Matthias, you leave here with a number of attributes that very few people carry out of this place at the very end of their time of service. You leave with respect and admiration. I think as we are hearing from friend and foe alike in the political context, and that is something that is a testament to the way in which you have engaged, as we have heard from so many. You leave also with achievement and legacy. You have not just served time in this place, you have achieved outcomes. And for those outcomes, you can leave with a sense of pride. Your family can have pride that the sacrifice has been worthy, and our government and our side of politics and the nation should have thanks for what it is that you have achieved in that time. You have also demonstrated drive to the very absolute final moment of your service in this chamber. You are not one who has put his feet up towards the end, as any of us who have been in receipt of those text messages this week have known as anyone who was involved in the preparation of the budget this week uh, would have known, uh, you have been there driving relentlessly, ruthlessly where necessary, right through. We arrived in this chamber together just a few weeks apart as uh, senators each filling casual vacancies in those final few months of the Howard government. And we've lived many ups and downs during that time, and it is wonderful to stand here at a high point for our government, but a most challenging point for the nation uh, as you move into the next phase of your life. Our journey through the days in opposition, where yes, there were there times where we would uh, tag team speaking along with uh, a number of others, much to Senator Wong and others' consternation for sometimes many hours on end. We would rail against the ruthless exercise of the guillotine by Senator Wong and other Labor ministers at the time. But as Senator Cormann reflected, we learnt a few lessons along the way about when and how to do so. We moved into government, uh, you uh, straight into the cabinet uh, as the finance minister for our whole duration of, uh, of our time uh, in government. And uh, that is a remarkable achievement by you and will be deeply felt uh, by the government in terms of you leaving that role and that loss of continuity. I, in many roles, have fronted up to the ERC to be bounced out with a Matthias Cormann no, <laughs> go back and sharpen up the pencil for something that comes at lower cost. And again, just as we learnt some tactics from Senator Wong in opposition, colleagues, hopefully I've learnt some tactics from Senator Cormann to take into those ERC conversations. Rosemary, I know you hope that I have too. In a leadership context, you have managed to negotiate, indeed, the coalition, each of our parties, with our points of difference at times, and to show respect to those points of difference, but to also hopefully bring us to points of unity. And it is on that front that I hope we can continue to all work together in the same vein. Both yourself and Senator Wong have spoken some fine words about how this chamber, this parliament, this place best works. And that's not to say that we aren't uh, a robust democracy. We must be a robust democracy. That is absolutely how it best works. But it is also the case that we should all be mindful of the way in which we engage in that robust activity. Uh, and I think you have both brought out the best in the debate today in doing so. I add my thanks to Hayley and my best wishes to Hayley, Charlotte and Isabel in terms of the future ahead. I, of course, am not hoping that they have quite as much time as some have reflected um, of your freedom, because uh, I hope, from a portfolio perspective that I currently hold, uh, that we enjoy the success of your candidacy uh, for the Secretary-General of the OECD, and that that leads to a new but equally busy life, a different one, 
uh, but a life indeed where you will make different contributions, uh, still bringing though the same drive, uh, the values uh, that help not just our country and our economy, uh, but countries and economies across the globe to succeed in the future. You're the right man for that job. You've been the right man for the jobs you have served in this place, and for that we thank you. Senator Patrick. Uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, Senator Cormann, I will be uh, one person who is very sad to see you go. I think you're a huge loss to the government. Uh, you've, you uh, play the role as leader of the government in the Senate, uh, as the finance minister, but also as the crossbench whisperer. And uh, it's from that perspective I'm going to talk briefly about my experiences with you. My experience with you started actually. <laughs> My experience with you started actually not as a senator but as, a, as, a, as an advisor to Nick Xenophon. Uh, and I was involved in a negotiation on uh, Clause 4.7 of the Commonwealth Procurement Rules. And uh, when I first walked into your office, office, even as a staffer, you were very respectful of, of me. And, uh, and we've heard that word being used a lot uh, throughout the, the words that have been spoken today. Um, I then, when I became a senator, my first day as a senator, I thought I'm going to take this bloke on. Right? So, I, so my, fir my first question, without notice, and I've got it here, um, uh, the, 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 the third supplementary. I said, Minister, you are the crossbench whisperer, whisperer, the deal maker. What effect do you think this breach of agreement with NXT will have on future crossbench negotiations? <laughs> now, no, and, and you can see how he's responding there, and I, and I, will, I will eventually come back to that. But but that's the point in which I worked out what Matthias' greatest weakness was, but also his greatest strength, and that was he cares about relationships. And that, in my view, has been his success in this place, uh, because he, he has maintained relationships uh, with, with everyone. Um, in your role as the crossbench whisperer, um, we haven't always agreed. There's been times when uh, you've annoyed me. There's been times when I've annoyed you, and there's been times when I've really annoyed you. Um, <laughs> but, it's, but, it, but it's fair to say that always, always, always you were professional. We've always had a very professional relationship. Um, one of the things that impressed me most about you, and, and I'm a crossbencher who has to deal with lots and lots of bits of legislation, uh, uh, as well as all of the other tasks. You are always across your brief. You are very impressive in that regard. When we negotiate, uh, you've always been respectful. Uh, things that were done in, in confidence were always held confidential, even at the point of disagreeing about things. I could always trust you, and I could always trust you in delivery. You were always available. Uh, Senator Cash talked about a 12, a 12 uh, 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 midnight uh, text. I remember one time having a meeting with, uh, with Senator Cormann in, uh, in Melbourne. Uh, actually, it was a dinner meeting. We had a dinner meeting to resolve uh, uh, an issue uh, to do with shipbuilding. And I won't say much more than this. Uh, in, in 30 years' time, maybe, uh, maybe someone will write about it. But we had a, we had a dinner. I went back to my cheap hotel. He was staying in a more expensive hotel. And uh, uh, at 4 a.m. I woke up and I thought, maybe I've got a solution uh, to this. And I sent him a text saying, are you awake? And of course he comes back, of course, you know, of course he was awake. I said, well, if you can organise coffee in your hotel, um, uh, I'll be there at 5 a.m. And uh, we met and we, we resolved something and, and in many years' time we can perhaps talk about that. But, uh, but, uh, uh, a good outcome for Australia, I might add. So, um, uh, the only time you really came close to sort of breaching uh, uh, tr trust in me was the was the time where you poached my senior advisor, uh, Jono, who's uh, probably still around there. He's up up in the gallery. He is a great man, and and, and the funny thing was, the funny thing was. Um, I knew that he was, he was going to go to a, a better position you know, uh, from a career perspective, but I sent you a text and I said, uh, it was, went something along the lines, uh, do you realise that Jono is the only one in my office that keeps me rational? 
and, and quickly, very quickly, uh, because he's always worried about relationships, he called me up. He said, "Rex, Rex, I, you know, I, I said to John O that he couldn't come if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't, uh, if you didn't approve." Now, of course, I approved because it was a, a career advancement for John O. But, uh, but again, uh, that, that showed his sensitivity to the relationships. And, and I know John O's uh, uh, served you well. And uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe with uh, some help with a letter to the prime minister, I'm happy to take him back. Okay, so. <laughs> But, uh, um, <laughs> so, yeah, well, he, the, the, the new crossbench, which is he's already upsetting me. Um, we've always got on well, and I'm, I think there's a real friendship there. And uh, uh, in the end, and I just want to go back to what I, what I said, and Mr. President, I'd like to withdraw some of the harsh remarks that I made in that first question on notice because. Actually, just recently on clause 4.7, you did issue a, a guidance note, which, was, which makes me much, much happier. So I think you've actually finally committed to all the, uh, uh, to everything you've ever, you've finally fulfilled everything you, uh, you committed to. Um, so I withdraw those, uh, those, those remarks I made. Um, the OECD could do with a bloke like you. That's, uh, you know, th that's my advice. Uh, the, the, they, they could come off with a lot, a lot worse candidates than, than Matthias Cormann. Um, as I said to you at the start, sad to see you go, but can I just say um, you'll never completely leave here because that, as a transparency extremist that I am, I am going to, on a regular basis, use the 2009 Cormann motion. Okay? <laughs> and others might necessarily know what that means, but that is a, a fantastic motion, and, I'm, uh, and, I, and I thank you for it. Matthias Cormann, good luck. Senator Reynolds. Oh, sorry. Oh. I'm going to go. go. All right, Senator Reynolds, I'll go to Senator Gallagher next. Sorry, I didn't see you standing. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Gallagher, as well. Well, I too stand here to pay tribute to my colleague and friend, Senator Matthias Cormann. Uh, Matthias, like myself, is a very proud West Australian and a very, very passionate Liberal for all of the reasons he and others have articulated so wonderfully in the chamber here today. Uh, but he is a great example of how good is Australia, and he's also a great example, I think, of how good a Liberal he is as well. So, Matthias, um, your time in this place, many people have talked about uh, the enormous contributions you've made as a senator and also as a shadow minister and a minister. But I also would like to share with some of the chamber about the great contributions you made also as a staffer uh, prior to that. And our nation does owe you, as has been articulated here, such a great thanks for the work that you have done, particularly in that uh, relentless focus on trajectory uh, during the seven last budgets. And there is no uh, time more than now when that has been so necessary. I'd like to, as I said, take my opportunity just to share a little bit of reflections on Matthias in a little more of a personal sense. Uh, Matthias and I first got to know each other and worked together in 2001 in the office of Senator Chris Ellison, where uh, I was his chief of staff at the time. Chris was a wonderful mentor, uh, as Matthias has said, but he also had, we had a great office at the time. There was Matthias, there was Dean Smith, um, there was Christian Porter and many others. And all of us do owe Chris a great debt of gratitude uh, for that experience. But on reflection, I think there's a couple of uh, things in that time that has also contributed to Matthias being uh, the man and the minister that he has been. Uh, it was during that time uh, in that office with Chris Ellison during 2001 and 2003 when I was there that shaped not only me going through the Bali bombing, September 11, uh, the uh, issues with uh, the boat arrivals and the, and the deaths. That certainly shaped all of us in that office. We saw the best of humanity and we also saw the absolute worst of humanity. And I know it shaped me in so many ways as I'm sure it uh, contributed to making Matthias, uh, as I said, who he is. That respect for human dignity, um, it, you know, the quality before the law, and also just understanding the need in this job for great compassion, but also for great strength, uh, and particularly in, in national security. 
And I've got to say, over the last 18 months, being on the National Security Committee of Cabinet, again seeing Matthias's very steady hand and very wise guidance uh, on that committee, not only dealing with issues, uh, significant issues of national security, but also that firm hand through COVID-19 and through the bushfire season. Uh, Matthias, uh, given the nature of those deliberations, nobody, there's only a small handful of us who will ever see that, but uh, your contribution to our nation's security as well cannot be underestimated. And there's something else I'd like to also share with you uh, that has given me, uh, you know, some, I think, some insights into Matthias. And back in 2001, Chris Ellison brought the, the team together, and Matthias, I think, came to see that almost as a second family. And over the last nearly 20 years, uh, no matter how busy Matthias has been, he has done everything he can to keep that family together. Uh, every year, no matter, as I said, how busy, he brings uh, all the past people who have worked for Chris Ellison together. And as Matthias's family has grown, uh, the Chris Ellison family uh, has continued to be part of uh, Matthias's family. And uh, there is no one who barbecues Belgian sausages better than Matthias Corman and also nobody who bakes a more impressive uh, cake and uh, birthday cake than Matthias. And again, Matthias, thank you for keeping uh, that team together and thank you for including us in your family's lives and you know, giving us a, a, a first-hand insight into some of the stresses and strains that Hayley uh, and the girls have, have worn in, in your service. So, as I say to our defence families, is their families serve alongside them in service of our nation, and your family has certainly served alongside you and made your contributions to our nation possible. So, like everybody else, I wish you all the best for the next phase of your career. Um, I absolutely hope, and I, you will make an outstanding Secretary General to the OECD. And uh, I can tell you the Ellison family will be more than happy to come to you for the next uh, Christmas uh, in Europe. So you are not only, in, in reference to cricket, I think you are the, possibly the finest Belgian batter and bowler that our nation has ever had, Matthias. And good luck and thank you for everything you've done for all of us. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I just rise to um, add a few contributions um, to um, the um, valedictory for Senator Cormann. Um, I, I rise as Shadow Finance Minister and um, I've only had that portfolio since May last year. And I, I do have a critique of your performance as Finance Minister, but perhaps you know, there's another time. Not, this isn't probably <laughs> the time. Yeah, yeah. I think that, that sounds pretty reasonable. Um, I think one of uh, your most significant strengths, and I think many others have spoken about this this morning, um, is in politics a lot of people undervalue relationships. And I think that's something it has been obvious to me since I came into the Senate you have never done. Uh, so you are able to build relationships across the chamber and I think the number of people in here and talking today uh, shows shows how much people have valued that over time. I think it is underrated in politics. Politics at its heart is a very honourable profession. Some of us, you know, some are closer to that than others, <laughs> perhaps. Um, but you know, serving the country, um, serving in a public way, it is an honourable profession. And I think people, we need people who aspire to that. I think you have aspired to that in politics, even though we, I disagree deeply with you on, on, on politics itself, on very many aspects of it. I do think that that's important, and I think you've shown that it matters. And I think, as a leader, that matters because that permeates across uh, the chamber. Um, I think the Senate relationships matter more than most uh, chambers in minority parliaments, um, and without a leader that values them, this would be a much messier place than it is um, at other times. I found you a rather frustrating opponent, and when I try and put my finger on why, I think you know it, it comes back to this: you, you're very capable, um, you know, as uh, a less, capable, a, a less capable opponent would have been uh, more welcome. Um, <laughs> um, in estimates, I think I went into estimates when I came to this place from government and came into opposition, 
and I thought I'd be really good at estimates. Um, and I remember you, people have used a cricket analogy, I think Senator Reynolds just did, I think you might have as well. I think I would describe you as a handy all-rounder, really. Um, and I, at estimates, I think I would try everything. I'd try to antagonise you, verbalise you, irritate you, go around you, go to the back of the budget books, go to the front of the budget books, just to find a way uh, to penetrate what I saw as an immovable object uh, in my way. Um, but you've taught me a lot. Through that. So when I'm finance minister, um, <laughs> you learnt from Penny. I'm learning from you, <laughs> and beware. Um, I'm going to be fabulous. Um, <laughs> anyway, back to you. Um, in terms of next estimates, and I said this before to you, please feel free not to attend. Uh, that's fine. Um, leave approved. Um, on a personal note, I've, you know, I know that you and Penny have a very um, strong personal friendship, and I, I saw a glimpse of that working in the role I have. But I also too have enjoyed um, some of the WhatsApp messages. Um, you know, the ambit where they start and where we get to in the end is—it's an interesting trail. If if we were ever, <laughs> if that confidence was ever to be betrayed, which it won't be. Um, on a personal level, um, you know, you show in my constitutional interlude, um, as I reflect <laughs> on it. You were very kind to me. It was, a, it was a difficult time, and I appreciate that very much. In terms of the transition out, I would, as someone who has left government and left being in the role where you make decisions and make things happen, it isn't as easy as you like to think. You think of all this quiet time and time with the family, which is you know, all very lovely. But there's also a part of you that has to adjust to a role where you don't just pick up the phone and order a range of people to deliver it, you know, to do certain things, or you're able to see a problem and fix it. Um, I think Senator Keneally's probably experienced this. We all have as we transition out of different roles. The caravan moves on very quickly, um, you know, and I think part of the transitioning out is being kind to yourself, acknowledging that, and that. You know, life's a funny thing. There is always other opportunities, and um, I know you know life post politics will be very good for you. And I hope that you get the time with your family uh, that you need in the interim. I think the other thing people, capable people, do is they sign themselves up for so many things mm -hmm. afterwards that you don't find that right balance. But um, I've enjoyed working with you, Matthias. Um, I'm not going to miss you at estimates. Um, I remember once moaning through estimates that we didn't get all your media releases, and um, you know, was there a reason why? You know, was there some conspiracy why we were off your email list? We tried to sign up, and uh, you assured me there was no issue, and you'd you'd take you'd go away and have a look at it, and <laughs> I've regretted it ever since <laughs> because I get everything about four times. I mean, they really listen to you and they've signed me up, and so now I just get, what has Matthias been up to? And some days you're very busy, um, but all the best. Um, I wish you, you and your family very well. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you, Mr President. Well, how good is Matthias Cormann? Um, you know, and I, the answer is, as I'm sure we all know, he is very, very good. And there are so many things that we can stand here and, and uh, bear testament to why he is so good. But I just thought I'd share with you a couple of reasons why I think Matthias Cormann is so good. I mean, he has the most extraordinary skills at herding cats. Um, as we know, on, uh, on our side, we have a very broad church, and he has to keep all of us in the corral at the same time. He's, uh, he's trying to round up the crossbench and, and all the while so he still seems to be able to keep a very close eye on what's going on on the other side of the chamber for any tactical moves that uh, might bring uh, his strategy of the day unstuck. Um, I think another one of his great skills is he is absolutely relentless, his persistence and, and his commitment to, uh, to work ethic. Um, you know, this guy doesn't ever leave anything in the tank, as we all know. And um, he will stay on the field. He will stay on the field until the absolute final siren, even when we're losing, in that just tiny little hope that some miracle will occur and he will actually be able to win. Um, he's also extraordinarily generous and, can I say, 
um, I have been the recipient of your extraordinary generosity in terms of your time um, and the support that you have given to me. I mean, there, you've never ever shied away from uh, spending time with me when I had a problem, showing me uh, the way forward. Uh, and I thank you very much for the, the support that you showed in, uh, in me. And I believe that uh, much of uh, my success in my political career has been down to the fact that you backed me in, um, and you backed me in with those that made the decisions. And so I thank you for um, where I am today. I mean, so much has been said in this chamber about uh, about Matthias, and I wish to associate myself with with just about all of those comments. Maybe not a few of the ones that we just got from Katie, but. Uh, um, you'll certainly be missed in this place. I am certainly going to miss you. Um, I'm even going to miss the WhatsApps at all hours of the day and night. I absolutely, definitely are going to miss the Lewin Estate uh, Chardonnay. Um, but I suppose um, I, the one thing that we all probably should miss, and that is your ruthless honesty. Uh, I'm not sure no an is ever going to be able to be delivered in quite the same way <laughs> that yours has. Um, but look, mate, um, Good luck, my friend. Uh, the next chapter of your life is, I'm sure, going to be just as exciting as the last one. Um, I hope it's at the OECD, but wherever it will be, they're going to be very lucky to have you. Thank you. Go well. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr President. On behalf of WA Labor senators, I'd like to uh, wish you, Senator Cormann, all the best for the future. When we first came into this place, your vigour and determination was evident from the outset. We did some community television together, and uh, Senator Cormann's dogged discipline around sticking to the key messages and key lines around uh, the Gillard the government's carbon tax, uh, when uh, you know was in endemically successful. Uh, I'm very sad to say. Um, and it is a discipline that uh, has clearly taken you to great heights in this place, and I thank you uh, for your service to the nation. Uh, marriage equality, the path that you took us on to get us there is not one with which I agreed, but I deeply respect uh, your commitment to getting it resolved uh, and that it's terrific uh, that, that, uh, is, that those rights and privileges uh, are now shared by all Australians, and I thank you for your commitment to resolving that, notwithstanding the fact that a great many of us disappear, uh, di uh, disagreed with the path uh, that you took. Um, I'll miss seeing you uh, down on down at O'Day, as occasionally we'd bump into each other. Me, you wearing a Liberal T-shirt, and we wearing a Socialist Republic of Crawley T-shirt, kindly supplied by Labor students. Um, I also like to thank you for standing up for WA. The GST resolution uh, is a significant milestone for our state. I thank you for working with the state Labor government and responding to the enormous pressure that the opposition, federal opposition, put you under in order to get that resolved. Uh, uh, so go well. I look forward to. I hope seeing you. Uh, active globally, but I'm sure it will also include bumping into you at a polling booth in the near future. Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Um, it's good to, uh, to associate myself with the very uh, timely and generous remarks of many uh, and to pay tribute to my good friend uh, and colleague Matthias Cormann. Now, Matthias and I, um, uh, we met a number of occasions uh, before I was in uh, this place. I remember meeting uh, Matthias and Haley and having a great night at a Young, young Liberals uh, function uh, where we hit it off quite well, and I think that might have been one of our first meetings. But one of the meetings I remember most uh, before coming into this place, it was around Christmas party 2012 uh, up here, Christmas party celebrations for the opposition as it was uh, then. And, I remember being sat down in Matthias's office, uh, and he said to me, "He said to me, he said to me, Zed, you should come join us here. It's very nice." And I, and I thought, well, you know, there's something in that. There's something in that. And uh, I think it was Matthias's encouragement uh, that was a very uh, big part of my decision uh, to come into this place. He did go on to say to me, he said, you know, you're playing in the VFL, you should come play in the <laughs> AFL. And, I, and, and, and I'm glad that I did. Um, I'm more of an NRL man myself, but uh, I think if we were to compare 
the Senate to the AFL. Uh, I think you'd have to acknowledge that over the last few years, uh, Matthias Cormann, uh, for our team, has been our captain coach uh, and very much our best and fairest, and has made an absolutely extraordinary contribution. Uh, and I think we can't sort of overstate uh, that contribution to the Senate, uh, to our party, and to our nation. Uh, I've had the the great privilege of being assistant finance minister uh, to our greatest. Uh, ever finance minister. It, it's, it's wonderful to be able to learn from the best. Uh, it really is. Um, but can I say that as much as I've been able to learn a lot uh, from Matthias and, and his amazing office uh, and the way he does things, and we've seen others like uh, me and, me and uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, of course, exchange notes on what it's like to work as Assistant Finance Minister. I've got to say the other part about being assistant to Matthias is that uh, it's really quite easy because he absolutely does everything. You know, he, just, he just makes sure he gets it all done, uh, and he does that in the most professional way. Uh, People have talked a lot about his energy uh, and his commitment. I still remember that 30-plus hour debate on Senate voting reform, and uh, you know, words, the words "energise a bunny" come to mind in the way that Matthias stayed in there for the whole time. I think there were a couple of toilet breaks, uh, but aside from that, he was there arguing the case as the opposition were uh, engaging in all sorts of games, and it was just a reflection of how much effort he puts in. I wanted to just have a couple of short reflections briefly before I finish uh, on Matthias as a thought leader. Uh, for the Liberal Party, and might I say particularly uh, for uh, the Conservatives uh, within the Liberal Party as well. Matthias speaks passionately about seeing East and West Berlin and what that meant for his political philosophy, these ideas of freedom, these ideas of personal uh, effort, reward for effort, stretching yourself. He, he, he speaks well and he spoke very well uh, in the speech again today. Uh, but I think also he has some other enduring values uh, about the importance of family, the importance of strong institutions, uh, the, the, the value and worth and dignity of every human life. And, uh, it, is, it, is, it is those things that I think has also made him a thought leader uh, within our movement. And Matthias, you've talked about being now citizen Cormann. Uh, can I say, uh, and I know many of my colleagues will appreciate this, that to us uh, you are and will always be a very solid citizen, Cormann, uh, and we acknowledge that, and I want to acknowledge that uh, on the record. Can I, can I say uh, briefly that I think history will judge uh, you very well, and I think in particular uh, you've had big moments where you've had to make big decisions, uh, and you've been criticised for some of those decisions. Uh, I think unfairly, and I think history will judge uh, the fact that you've made uh, the right decisions for our party and the right decisions for our nation. And I'd like the record to reflect that. Uh, just uh, finally, I wanted to pay tribute to Hayley and Isabel and Charlotte. Uh, you know, Hayley is an amazing woman, uh, an absolutely amazing woman, and of course she has uh, borne the burden uh, that you have borne, but in a, in a very different way, in a very significant way. Uh, and she has served our nation. Uh, in, in being there uh, for you and, as you point out, not just being an amazing wife and mother but going on to an extraordinary career of her own in the meantime. So I want to pay tribute to Hayley uh, and to Isabel and Charlotte and to thank you for lending uh, you to our nation uh, in this capacity for a number of years. We wish you well. Uh, I look forward to seeing uh, your future endeavours and uh, certainly I believe Paris will not know what hit, hit them. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, I too would like to make a short contribution to the valedictory for Senator Cormann, Matthias. Um, I think it's important to associate myself with remarks across the chamber. Um, it's Matthias's strength of character, which is one of the things that's brought out the best in this place. There's not too many occasions where we all come together and we agree on something in the way that we have today. Uh, but Matisse's strength of character, his relationships across the chamber uh, are one of those moments where it is the best of this place, where we all uh, acknowledge the contribution that uh, Matisse has made. Uh, he made a point in his speech about the philosophy, what he believed in and why, uh, and that's carried him, him all the way through his time here. I sincerely hope that the rest of the world gets the 
opportunity to have the benefit of that uh, through the OACD. I really do wish you the very best in that quest, Matthias, your philosophy and particularly your character. Mm. Particularly your character, which has been demonstrated by the comments that have been made around the chamber today, um, will be of enormous benefit. Um, I can retire, I think, a newspaper clipping from the Mercury in 1981 where a former Senator Bob Brown was extolling the virtue of building coal-fired power stations in the Fingal Valley when he was campaigning against renewable hydroelectricity in Tasmania. Um, I, I think that can be t retired back to my office rather than being maintained here in the drawer in the chamber. Um, I'm not, I couldn't count the number of times that I handed that to Matthias when he was responding to, an, uh, to a, uh, a question uh, from our friends in the Greens. Uh, Mr. President, the acknowledgement of his respect for this institution, I think, is a really important point. Uh, and, and I acknowledge the comments that Senator Wong made in that respect. Uh, this is an important chamber. It's an important institution. Um, and and it, it deserves all our respect. It's very easy for us to get caught up in the hurly-burly of the contest across the chamber, but we all should remember uh, what this institution is about and the importance of it. And uh, I, I, I acknowledge the comments that Senator Wong made with respect to the boundaries that we should all place in that sense. It's a really important sentiment. Uh, and um, one sh we should remember. I too have felt the brunt of uh, Senator Cormann at ERC, as so many on our side have, and the philosophy that he brings. Uh, but it is a really important discipline for us all going in there when we're seeking resources, taxpayers' funds, taxpayers' resources uh, that we might want to expend. Uh, and he always had. Uh, a very strong and sound argument to back up his thoughts. He's been an extraordinarily strong counsel for so many of us in this place. Uh, and I would say, in the context of his leadership of the government in the Senate, um, uh, an extraordinarily strong shepherd in keeping the coalition working together um, and maintaining all of us where we needed to be. Uh, and in the circumstances where some of us not, might not have been where we needed to be to make sure that we got there quickly. Uh, Mr President, it's probably a, it's something senators would understand, but I would regard Matisse, Senator Cormann, as a senator's senator. And the fact that he's going out on estimates is probably the best demonstration of that. Um, senator Gallagher might like to see him go earlier, uh, but we're very pleased that in, in, in a generous way. I'm happy to acknowledge that, Senator Gelly. Um, but the fact that Matthias is going out on estimates demonstrates that he, that he is a senator's senator. People in this chamber understand that context, I think. Um, uh, he, he acknowledged the work that he did with now Prime Minister Morrison with respect to GST. I know that my state, our state, home state, Tasmania, played a very uh, robust role in that. But the outcome that was achieved as a part of that process as you acknowledged in your uh, valedictory speech, uh, it is an important one because it was an important one for uh, the country. So I, I would like to acknowledge that. Um, as has been acknowledged across the chamber, he is a senator who got things done, a minister who got things done. Uh, we all have a time here. Matthias has acknowledged and understood his time, but using your time in this place effectively is a really important thing for us all to remember, because we all do have our time. Uh, he has done that, and he has got things done, which is, I think, really important. Uh, he's going to be a huge loss to our side of politics. I think he'll be a huge loss to the chamber. Um, but, I, but I do hope that he's uh, a gain for the global uh, finance organisation of the OECD. I really do hope that we wish you success on that. But of course, um, as we all know, life is what happens to you while you're planning to do something next. So whatever it is that happens next for you and your family, Matthias, uh, all the very, very best. Uh, thank you for your service to this chamber 
and to the country. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. We have uh, many privileges as uh, senators, and one of those is to watch uh, at close proximity um, events that shape the government, events that shape our country. Uh, today is one of those events. It's an important day, sad day, important day for the Senate chamber. It's an important day for this coalition government. It's a very, very important day for Western Australia. And we can't underestimate, so we can't overstate just how significant uh, this is. As someone who is uh, very, very keen on the history of our parties, Bridget, someone who's very keen on the history of this Senate chamber in our country, uh, I suggest that there's been no more significant event in the life of this coalition government than the departure of our friend, Matthias Cormann. We are all saddened uh, for our loss, but excited for Matthias and Hayley and the girls. Not the end, but the beginning of a bright, new and exciting chapter for Matthias, and we send him with our best wishes. As we know, one of Matthias' greatest joys is when a plan comes together. Um, Matthias and I have known each other a long time. I first met Matthias uh, shortly after his arrival in Australia. Matthias and I have worked on some very big plans together uh, and they've been very visible. We've also worked on a few invisible plans. And uh, again, that speaks to his character, that Matthias's word is something that you can rely on, is something that you can bank. We thank you very, very much for the way you have led this team. It's been a great honour, and I thank you very personally for the trust that you put in me to be uh, the Chief Government Whip uh, under your leadership. It's been a pleasure to do so. Colleagues, um, we will be able to say, we will be able to say, others that come after today won't be able to say that we worked with that senator, Senator Matthias Cormann. Uh, we knew him, uh, that he knew us. That is the greatest of privileges. Senator Dunham. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, great snakes is a phrase oft used by uh, Senator Cormann's animated hero, uh, Tintin, and it is a phrase that came to mind when uh, <laughs> Captain Haddock off the movie. Yeah, I've got a Captain Haddock coming up. Yeah, <laughs> but it was a phrase that came to mind when we did learn the news that uh, Senator Cormann would be leaving us, and um, of course the question that came to mind for me was, whatever will we do? And in reflecting on that question. I thought about the contribution that Senator Cormann, as leader in this place and as someone who has had several significant roles, both in opposition and in government for the coalition over a long time, has made. And the biggest one, as a relative, I mean, I've been here a bit over four years now and still a relatively young member of our team, uh, is the mentoring and the nurturing uh, and the shepherding, as I think Senator Colbeck referred to it as um, before, of younger members of our team, uh, bringing us in helping us to understand how we can effectively advocate for our communities, for our beliefs within the party room uh, and uh, for good outcomes and to, uh, as Senator Smith uh, rightly said, find ways to bring plans together and um, actually get some good outcomes for the people we represent. And so I just briefly want to say to Senator Cormann that um, you know, he, in his remarks said that he feels some comfort in leaving here. Uh, that, and I think there is good reason for that. That mentoring that he has, the investment he has made in uh, other members in this place, the members of his team, uh, leaves behind a great team and an amazing legacy um, that this country will benefit from for generations to come. So hopefully I can get this Tintin quote right. Um, as Red Rackham said to Sir Francis Haddock, we will meet again in another time. I wish you and your family well and thank you. 
two out of two ain't bad, but thank you, Senator Cormann. <laughs> Senator O'Sullivan. <laughs> Very well. Very well done. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll keep my remarks uh, brief. Um, Matthias Cormann, I'm here today um, because of your support. Um, there's, no, there's no exaggeration. Uh, you uh, have mentored me, you've shown me, um, you've, you've guided me through the process, both through a pre selection, uh, through uh, you know, what, what it takes to uh, serve the party. Uh, to position yourself and then now here uh, as the newest West Australian Senator from the Liberal Party here. Uh, I'm, I'm here because of, uh, very much because of your support and I'm very, very grateful for it. Uh, there's a quality that uh, some have mentioned here already that uh, I just want to echo and that's that uh, quality that you have of generosity. Um, you've given so much to all of us, you've given so much to me. And the, the true mark of generosity is when you, you do that without any expectation of anything in return. And that's, that's what you've shown. Um, and I just want to uh, put on record my sincere thanks to you. Uh, to Haley as well. Haley has been an incredible encouragement to me in, in my journey in getting here and, uh, and even being here and supporting. Uh, it, it, you know, she's an amazing woman, amazing woman, and she's a, such a, an encouragement. You, know, you spend any time with Haley, you leave. Just feeling encouraged, uh, and your family is 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 beautiful. And for, for my wife uh, and, and I, uh, we we look to you guys. We look at seeing how you manage the the busyness of life and this job, uh, yet still maintain a, a very strong and, and beautiful relationship. And as a father to your children, we, we get to see it. We're, those in WA are a little closer. We get to see the the impact that you have on your children and and the beautiful way that you as a father, even though you, the pressures have been on you to, um, uh, to, to provide that, that amazing support to them. And I think it, it's a real testament to your quality and your character. I uh, can also just say, you know, on behalf of, um, for, you know, for the Liberal Party in Western Australia, the way that you have uh, helped shepherd and, and, uh, and provide leadership within the, the WA Liberal Party, it's, uh, it, it's phenomenal. Uh, it, it's, uh, you're going to be uh, significantly missed in that. Um, uh, I hope we don't completely see you disappear uh, in terms of the, the uh, not leaving the party. That's good. <laughs> um, uh, Matthias, uh, we, we, we're a very strong division and uh, it's, it's tribute to you and, and there's many others that have contributed to that, but I think it would be hard to find anyone that has had such an impact upon the WA Liberal Party and, and you know, on behalf of other uh, Liberal Party members, and in fact, those that are back home, uh, we've got a state election coming up, and there's so many candidates that you know I think would all love the opportunity to be able to stand here like this today and just say thank you for what you've done. The, the great organisation that we have back there is in very much a, uh, a tribute to you, and uh, and I thank you very much indeed. So I'll go to a couple of senators remotely. I'll start with Senator Brockman. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it's truly an honour be able to make a contribution on the departure of my good friend and up until now seemingly perennial boss, Matthias Gorman. Uh, seven and a half years as a staffer and three years in the Senate with Matthias as Senate leader. What can I say but free at last, free at last. Uh, when I first went to work for Matthias, I was only going to be there for a year or two, but the things we all know about Matthias, the fine mind, the extraordinary work ethic, the ability to understand both the policy and politics uh, of an issue kept me there and in the end helped bring me into the Senate. Opposition was tough, but Matthias made absolutely the most of it. Uh, forensic use of orders for the production of documents, the changes to the public interest immunity claims, which Senator Patrick spoke about, uh, a number of committee reports that changed the public debate on issues. Uh, these, this demonstration and proved level of achievement improved our public life and improved the Senate. But in my time as Matthias's senior staffer, I'd often get the question, 
Well, what's it like with raised eyebrows? What's he like to work for? And I'd never say it was the easiest of jobs, but it was extraordinarily rewarding. Uh, Matthias's attention to detail was and is legendary, but beyond, beyond the level of, of mere mortals such as myself, uh, the standards he set for himself were incredibly demanding. Uh, the middle of the night uh, Sky News slots, uh, West Australian time that is, are legendary. Uh, less well known are the draft committee reports, hundreds of pages long, that were his holiday reading. Uh, but Matthias was also very conscious of the impact of the life we led on family and was always unhesitating in being as flexible as possible to make the demands, at least on his staff, uh, more manageable. I'm not sure you always allowed yourself that leeway, Matthias, but certainly from a staffing point of view, you were extraordinarily generous. Uh, I will add uh, my thanks and acknowledgement to Matthias's staff, many of whom I worked with, uh, in particular Natasha Lobo, who's been there from the beginning, but exceptional people like Philippa Campbell, uh, Daniel Clode, Chris Brown, uh, Karen Wu, and so many others. The fact that Matthias attracted and retained such exceptional people says a lot about Matthias as a boss, but also Matthias as a man. Matthias is trustworthy and honourable. He has been in a position where he's had to take the hard decisions and the thing that I most admire about you, Matthias, is that you have never shirked that responsibility. Uh, you're not one to dwell on the past, but history will record that bravery well. Now, the accolades Matthias receives as Australia's longest serving finance minister, uh, and in my possibly biased opinion, the finest and without doubt the most influential finance minister, are well earned. Uh, as Matthias has said many times, no one's indispensable to the team, but Matthias, you will be sorely missed. You have been a loyal boss, a good friend, and a very supportive colleague. You are a wonderful servant to the Conservative cause, to our great Liberal Party, to Western Australia, to our nation. I already described in my first speech how uh, Matthias' advice led me to meeting Rebecca, so I won't repeat that today. Suffice it to say that your ongoing advice will be all, always highly valued by me and by so many of our colleagues. From Rebecca and my family, to you, to Hayley, to Isabel and Charlotte, all the best for whatever the future holds. Senator Kitching remotely. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to add my voice to the valedictory speeches for Senator Cormann. I first spoke with Senator Cormann at Estimates, but really after a Remembrance Day event in Canberra in 2017, where Senator Cormann spoke movingly about the consequences of the First World War for his country of birth, Belgium. It was obvious to anyone who heard that speech the understanding Senator Cormann has of the human condition. But it was really after a rather inflammatory tweet of mine, I hasten to add, when Senator Cormann phoned to ask if he could speak with me about it. I have to say, it is not often my experience, Mr. President, that my Twitter leads to the making of a new friend. Often have we met to have a glass of West Australian wine or two and or champagne, and occasionally some corn chips as well. But this is the measure of Senator Cormann. I think not only in recent days where people have said deservedly kind things, but even from before I came to this place, I heard from senators from all sides and also from members of the Liberal Party who said good things about Senator Cormann. He is someone who deals with people as he finds them, someone who is generous with people. He is, he is someone who has both the characteristics of that other famous Belgian, Tintin, his morality and his authenticity, and also Asterix the Gaul, who is renowned for his shrewd intelligence and his bravery. And I know Senator Cormann is very familiar with both of these characters, 
And similarly, we both read asterisk in Latin as part of the fun part of studying that language at school. I know that recently Senator Cormann's office purchased, purchased him some Tintin themed masks. And could I turn to Senator Cormann's office? Wise people in this building have told me that parliamentarians' offices often reflect the parliamentarian. Senator Cormann's staff members are professional, happy, and always gracious to odd visitors to their office. And I thank them for that and for always making me feel welcome. We know from his own valedictory speech a short time ago, the regard that Senator Cormann has to history and to philosophy and to the greatness of democracy. We know that in this place, it is not the people who are vibrant with passion for how Australia can be a better place who are unwanted, but rather those who cease to care. The people in this place who are engaged, who do care, who are willing to have the argument, both in the chamber and outside, but who do that with respect, who can find common ground. For all of those people, Senator Cormann is an exemplar and his kindness and his compassion about his fellow human beings is at the forefront. Australia has been very lucky to have you in this place and your family has been very generous in that regard. And the OECD would be very lucky to have you as the Secretary General. But wherever life takes you, you will always have your excellent character and your sense of humour. So it's not adieu, but rather bonne chance pour la suite et à bientôt. Thank you, Mr. President. I will take the opportunity to briefly <laughs> conclude the debate. I promise to be brief. I'm not going to repeat everything everyone has said, but tell a few anecdotes that illustrate the points that everyone has made, the common themes that have been mentioned here this afternoon. But personally, I think we should all acknowledge, and particularly those of us from the East, that the burden people carry coming from the West to play an active role in public life in Australia and by their families is truly extraordinary. Uh, when you combine that with the work ethic that others have spoken about with Matthias, the burden upon him, but also Hayley and the girls and those others close to him, uh, has been extraordinary. It is so much tougher because of the time differences and the sheer number of hours on planes. Um, Matthias's work ethic was demonstrated in many ways, but in my case, when I was ill, he had to step into my portfolio. And all I remember my staff telling me when I came back to work was it was fantastic because at 11 o'clock at night, um, on a Thursday night, when he got off the plane in Perth, their phones didn't light up with all the WhatsApp messages and emails that had been prepared on the plane on the way over, because every single minute was a minute um, to take advantage of for his purpose in public life. When I sat in on ERC for a couple of years, I, he, Matthias's command of detail without meaning to begrudge anyone else was truly extraordinary. And the size of those folders and the breadth of government activity um, was very difficult for any person to get across, but Matthias did. Um, I do think I hold the record for the only spending minister to come into ERC, though, and when having a program cut, offered up more uh, and said, you can have the whole program. Um, it was the only time I think I saw Matthias a stone visage at, at, at ERC crack. He hadn't had that happen before. Um, without meaning to be flippant, you know, someone else might have claimed the title, but Matthias was the fixer of the government, because the fixing of the government actually has to happen in this chamber. This is where announcements in the other place, down at the other end of this building, get turned into law, where public resources get determined whether they're tax cuts or spending programs. If you can't make this chamber work, you can't make the Australian Parliament work. And everyone has an experience of that. Uh, Matthias would ha happily prosecute a collective decision and he did not take differences personally. I had my share of differences. Life would be boring if we didn't, on our own side or on the other side. But Matthias always had the ability to go on with a collective decision that was taken with a common purpose. In the end, um, I would say that he held himself to the standards he expected of others. And that is really um, one thing we can all aspire to and share. So, um, Matthias, congratulations um, to your family. Very best wishes to you professionally. Very, very best wishes. And farewell for the last time from the chamber, if not from the work of the Senate, over the next few weeks. Um, I now say, um, pursuant to order, the Senate will now adjourn without debate. I remind senators that legislation committees will meet to consider estimates commencing on Monday, the 19th of October at 9 a.m. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again on Monday the 9th of November at 10 a.m.